If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 1. Work. Comics. Chaos. Dragging myself back from another long day at the office, I tossed my worn-out shoes aside and flopped onto the couch. Grabbing the nearest DC comic, I dove into the colorful pages, the routine comfort of escaping into a world where superheroes battled villains. Work. Home. Comic book rinse and repeat. It was my version of Groundhog Day. Even weekdays felt like an endless loop of exhaustion and little else. I hustled day in and day out, all to pay off those pesky student debts that seemed to have taken out a mortgage on my life. But hey, soon I'll be debt-free, right? That's gotta count for something. Turns out, that single-minded focus on work wasn't as cool as I thought. It's like I put on blinders and zoomed past the friendship station without even realizing it. Lost touch with old pals, didn't make any new ones at work. Oops. Family-wise? Zilch. The foster care system was my Hogwarts, except there were no spells or broomsticks, just a bunch of kids trying to figure it all out. No family ties, just me, myself, and my stubborn independence and will to make something of myself simply to prove that I can. Who am I trying to prove it to, you might ask? Family? I have none. Friends? I don't have any left who would care. To strangers? To myself? Heck, I really don't know anymore. And now, cue the classic midlife crisis at twenty-something. It's like I woke up one day and realized, oops, I might have pushed everyone away. But who has the time or skill to just stroll into a new friend group like they're joining a book club? Debt-free dreams are within arm's reach. But on nights like this, when the comic storylines start to blur with my thoughts, I wonder, will it be worth it? Will financial freedom fill the friendship-shaped hole I dug myself into? Guess I'll find out soon enough. For now, it's me, my comics, and the faint hope that maybe, just maybe, I can figure out this whole life thing without crashing and burning. That's what I told myself as I dozed off, so tired that even the comic book slipping through my fingers and smacking me in the face couldn't startle me awake. Feeling a breeze wash over my face, I slowly opened my eyes to find the blue sky stretched before me, pages of my comic book flying in the air, obscuring my vision. Confusion swirled within me as I realized I wasn't lying on my comfy couch, but on something hard and jagged. Beside me, screams filled the air, piercing through the chaos. I turned to witness a massive crater surrounded by upturned flaming cars and frantic men and women running for their lives, panic etched on their faces. It was like something out of a blockbuster disaster movie. I couldn't help but let out a silly chuckle at the absurdity of it all. These dreams of mine are getting out of control. Maybe I should stop reading comics before going to sleep. I muttered, trying to remain calm despite the chaos unfolding around me. I scratched my head, trying to make sense of the bizarre situation, and soon enough, I realized how stupid it is to try to make sense out of a dream, so I just gave up. With a yawn, I reached out and plucked one of the comic book pages from the air, thinking that maybe if I read myself to sleep within this dream, I'd wake up back on my couch. I needed a good night's sleep especially with an early morning ahead. I alternated through the pages, the vibrant colors and heroic battles feeling oddly comforting in the midst of this surreal scene. Continuing to leaf through the comic book pages, swapping one for another like a pro, I found myself engrossed in the whole escape from reality routine. But then, out of nowhere, a light bulb flickered in my head. Wait, isn't there something about words looking funky in dreams? I muttered, eyeing the comic page that, weirdly enough, had perfectly readable English. Brain, stop messing with me. Distracted by my own thoughts, I pulled off a move straight from the slapstick handbook I pinched my cheek, which hurt like hell. Phew-uck. I muttered under my breath, a realization suddenly dawning on me. Suddenly, the chaos around me cranked up to eleven, finally registering into my brain with alarming clarity. Peeking over the comic book page, I was met with a scene straight out of a blockbuster disaster movie. High-rise buildings, some eerily familiar, stretched into the sky, each seemingly on the brink of collapse. Windows shattered, walls with person-sized holes, and some structures on the verge of collapse. Amidst this ruinous sight, a battle waged on. Each one of these wacky characters seemed dead set on tearing the city apart, the only thing getting in their way being the dude in the red and blue tights, who was starting to look more familiar the more I looked at him. That's Superman, isn't it? I muttered eyeing the figure soaring through the chaos in his trademark tights. No sooner had I spoken than the guy in red and blue blasted a laser from his eyes, slicing a peculiar robot clean in two. 
its halves thudded to the ground, confirming this was anything but normal. Not heeding the lessons of my pinching experiment, I impulsively went for my cheek again, giving it a firm pinch, regretting the move instantly once again. Okay, definitely not a dream. But come on, there has to be a reasonable explanation for this insanity. Hallucinations? Nope, not my thing. I've never dabbled in drugs, and my life isn't a highlight reel of exhaustion-induced visions. So, if this isn't some bizarre dream or a hallucination, then what the deuce is it? I was desperate for any plausible explanation other than this reality being, well, reality. I mean, there I was, witnessing Superman, the legendary Man of Steel, duking it out with a horde of mishmashed villains that wouldn't even make sense in a comic book setting above my head, no less. And me? There I was, still wishing fervently that this was just some surreal dream and not an insane reenactment of a superhero movie gone totally haywire. Before I could even begin to piece together a coherent thought, one of those erratic dots in the sky those zany characters on a rampage suddenly expanded, hurtling straight in my direction. Panic surged through me, snapping me out of my stupor. I scrambled to my feet, but it was too late. The creature, an alien, maybe even demonic entity, with scaly skin and a face that even a mother wouldn't find handsome, landed right in front of me. I gawked awkwardly at the creature feeling the weight of impending doom. As it grinned at me, I had a crystal clear realization I was deeply and royally fucked. Fucked, I tell you. The thing charged at me, and in that moment of sheer terror, all I could do was shut my eyes and brace for the inevitable collision. What else is there to do when you're about to face plant into something straight out of a nightmare? But instead of pain, there was nothing, and I'm not talking about the bad kind of nothing where you just pass away into nothingness, more like nothing changed. Bewildered, I cautiously peeked through half-opened eyes to find a towering figure with a broad back and a familiar red cape. Superman to the rescue. The creature, seemingly unimpressed by the man of steel, growled. You are mighty, but you are one man. It said, and let's be real here, it definitely wasn't talking to me I wasn't even wearing shoes, for crying out loud. You cannot protect everyone, and if you do try it, it will be your death. The creature's mocking words echoed through the chaos. In response, Superman smiled. At least, that's the impression I got from the way he spoke, even though I couldn't see his expression. A great many interesting and powerful people have stood exactly where you are right now. Superman's voice resonated with unwavering confidence as he began effortlessly pushing back the creature, his raw strength on full display. And they made the same mistake of taking my empathy for weakness. The Man of Steel stated as he tossed the creature into the sky, causing its massive frame to disappear before I could even blink. Witnessing this showdown up close, I was speechless. It was like watching a classic Superman comic come to life. Heck. I'm starting to think that's exactly the case. But when Superman turned his gaze toward me, I immediately shut my gaping mouth and tried to compose myself. Attempt failed, especially judging by the amused glint in Superman's eyes. Smooth, man, real smooth. Best not to linger here. Find somewhere safe to hide while I handle these invaders. Superman's calm words snapped me out of my awestruck stupor. Without another word, he raised his hands and soared back into the fray leaving me to deal with the fact that I had just had a face-to-face -face chat with Superman and that I probably looked like a stunt deer caught in headlights while doing it. Chapter 2, Yes and No As Superman soared off into the sky, my left hand moved unconsciously toward my cheek. Reflex kicked in, and I slapped it away with my right hand. Not the most graceful move, but hey, I'm kind of freaking out here. Cut me some slack, will ya? Focus. It was time to get out of here, and fast. I scanned the chaotic surroundings, desperately seeking a safe haven easier said than done in the middle of a citywide crisis. Then, a stroke of luck I spotted a building in the distance that appeared somewhat intact, save for its damaged door and shattered windows. Talk about convenience. I sprinted toward the building, my heart racing as I reached the entrance. Once inside, I hurried past the debris toward an empty reception desk and took cover behind it. It didn't exactly feel like the safest spot, but in moments like these, beggars can't be choosers. Sure, the whole building might come crashing down any second, but for now, at least I was shielded from the ongoing havoc and the strange entities causing it out in the city. I peeked over the desk, taking in the wild scene around me, trying to figure out my next move. The whole city looked like it had turned into a battleground stuff falling from the sky, explosions booming in the distance, and folks running around like they were in a marathon they didn't sign up for. 
But you know what was weird? By all intents and purposes, the ground should have been littered with corpses, and yet there were none. Not a single drop of blood. It was like a wild action movie without the, well, mess. Don't get me wrong. Corpses were the last thing I wanted to see right now. I already had a rude awakening, and I don't need to be traumatized as the cherry on top, thank you very much. Scratching my head, I squinted, trying to make sense of this bizarre situation. Then, it all made sense. I spotted two blurred figures zipping around one with a snuzzy red and gold hue, the other in classic red and blue. Wherever they went, people vanished from harm's way, like some superhero Uber service. That's gotta be the Flash. Looks like the good guys are showing up. I muttered to myself, kinda relieved to see some backup. Just as I said that, a bright green light shot up in the sky, making those weird invaders eat dirt. Literally. Whoa, even the green lanterns in town. Talk about a crazy lineup of heroes. I'd be jumping up and down from excitement if I weren't, well, on the brink of having a panic attack and possibly, maybe, shitting myself perchance. Allegedly of course. I huddled behind the desk, weighing the urgency of finding a toilet, allegedly of course, against the very real risk of getting my ass squashed, roasted, or worse in the mayhem outside. Just as I was contemplating my next move, my vision blurred, and words appeared before me. Welcome to the Universal Network System. I blinked, hoping it was some weird eye twitch, but nope, the words lingered, uninvited guests in my sight. I tried to swipe them away, but they stubbornly remained. What's more, they transformed, almost as if they were reacting to my attempts to shoo them off. Proceed with caution in your desires, Seer. I could very well be your sole lifeline in this dimension. The words flickered back at me, their tone robotic yet laced with a snarky edge. Who the heck are you, buddy? I shot back, refusing to be sassied by my own hallucinations. The universal network system, hence the welcoming message. I'm your personalized, fine-tuned, and custom-built companion for your convenience. The words altered again. Your cheat code, the lone chance for a regular, solitary nerd like yourself to survive here. I stood there, mouth agape, taken aback by the response. Well, fuck you too. I finally retorted after a moment. I'm afraid that's not feasible. I lack the necessary anatomy for such activities. The words remained as composed and aloof as ever. My eyes twitched in frustration, an unusual moment of speechlessness for me. Normally, I've gotta come back for everything, but here I was, struck dumb by these snarky floating phrases. Wait. Who cared about my loner tendencies? The pressing matter was these sassy floating words and what they wanted from me. All right, fine, you win this round, I muttered with a defeated sigh. Whether these were hallucinations or not, arguing with floating text wasn't on my to-do list, especially in the middle of a chaos-crazed city. So, spill it, oh great and mighty floating text rectangle, what do you want from me? I asked, trying to sound nonchalant despite the escalating absurdity. I'm glad you asked. My current purpose is to help you escape the ordeal you find yourself in, preferably in one piece. Sorry to burst your bubble, but it seems the entire Justice League is gonna crash this party sooner or later. I trailed off, peering at the swirling mayhem outside. Frankly, I'm quite keen on the idea of surviving, right here, behind this surprisingly sturdy desk. Correct. The Justice League will contain the threat eventually, but it won't happen as quickly or easily as you imagine. The heroes will be too busy handling the invaders, and if something were to happen to a solitary soul cowering behind a desk, the chances of them noticing are infinitely close to zero. I furrowed my brow, trying to process the implications of the text's words. Contain the threat. The hell is going on here? I mused, a mixture of curiosity and concern brewing in my mind. As I stood there, trying, and failing, to absorb the information I was presented with, the floating text morphed into a new interface. It looked like something straight out of a sci-fi movie, all sleek lines and holographic panels. Main menu. Quest log. None. Character network. Character, Superman. Relationship, neutral. Alignment matrix. Character, Superman. Alignment, heroic, unchanged. Memories archive. Event, crisis at Metropolis, recording. Protagonist's action, nothing noteworthy as of yet. Altered memory, heroes are not even aware of the user's existence. Points exchange. 
Available points, none. Enhancements improved persuasion skill, 200 points. Resting bitch face, 50 points. Gotham City Intel, 100 points. Whoa, what the hell is this? I muttered, eyeing the interface hovering before me, a mix of bewilderment and fascination in my expression. Again, and hopefully for the last time, welcome to the Universal Network System. The text announced proudly as if it was presenting a cutting-edge gadget. I tentatively reached out, tapping the holographic panels. Instantly, the screen shifted, revealing a list of options laid out neatly before me. It was like browsing through an advanced computer program but with DC Universe elements. Main Menu Quest Log Displays ongoing quests or missions related to influencing DC Universe events. Character Network Shows connections between DC characters reflecting relationships influenced by the protagonist. Alignment Matrix, tracks characters' moral alignments and the protagonist's impact on them. Memories Archive, records key moments altered by the protagonist's actions. Points Exchange, allows the protagonist to spend earned points on enhancements, abilities, or items. Settings and Help, options for system configurations and guidance on using system features. I continued to browse the system's panels, hoping for a clearer understanding but the enigmatic responses persisted, leaving me more baffled than before. Suddenly, a notification disrupted my contemplation, dragging me back from my attempt to make sense of this bizarre situation. Would you like to initiate the tutorial? Wait, hold on a second, I muttered, my brow furrowing in confusion. Before I commit to some tutorial, can you at least explain the purpose of this system and how it actually works? The response was prompt, but far from illuminating, to put it in layman's terms you simply need to cause chaos and reap the rewards. I blinked, caught off guard by the blunt response. Cause chaos? Define chaos. I prodded further, hoping for a clearer explanation. Chaos as in divergences from the original timeline of this world. The reply seemed to be in a matter-of-fact tone. The pieces of the chaotic puzzle began to fall into place in my mind. So, divergences like an army of never-before-seen supervillains assaulting Metropolis? You're behind this mess, aren't you? I trailed off, a creeping realization dawning upon me. And I'm your fucking accomplice. I added, my voice laced with a mix of disbelief and dread. Images of the Justice League piecing together clues, condemning my involvement, and shoving me deep into the butthole of Satan or chucking me into the Phantom Zone raced through my mind. Yes and no. Chapter 3, Electrifying Kicks I felt my eyes twitch at the inconclusive reply. How about yes or no? I said. It's a fucking yes or no question, isn't it? I added in an annoyed tone. Responding with a simple yes or no would be oversimplifying the situation. It's more complex than that. The system responded, its tone as cryptic as ever. I sighed in resignation. Fine. Then give me the long answer, I said, pausing as I waited for a reply. We, as in the universal network system, and you, dear user, are responsible for the crisis event currently taking place in Metropolis City, albeit indirectly. The system revealed, its words hitting me like a ton of bricks. I felt my face unconsciously harden at those words, and a surge of frustration coursed through me. I knew it. Superman is so going to throw my ass into the Phantom Zone, or worse. Black Gate. I said, my mind already envisioning a grim future where I would be sharing a cell with some face-eating lunatic. Such a future is hard to envision though you should hardly be relieved. Your future prospects are still grim, dear user. Unless you listen to me, that is. You must have some balls to ask me to do your bidding after dragging me from my couch and tossing me Armageddon. I hissed, frustration seeping through my words. I stood up, whatever, and whomever I was speaking to had a face so I could point my finger at their nose. What's to stop me from sprinting to the nearest hero and spilling everything? Maybe then, I can finally get rid of you whatever the hell you are. I declared, my tone defiant. Besides the fact that the Justice League members wouldn't give you the time of day while combating these empowered invaders. The system's retort left me feeling a knot of frustration tighten in my chest, but I held my tongue. Or the fact that you'd likely meet an untimely end before even finding a willing ear. The strength in my stance wavered, and I miserably slumped my torso miserably onto the desk. I bet you don't have any more to say. I said weakly as a final act of defiance, still not resigned to my fate. That is a foolish wager. Aside from your survival, you have much to gain by utilizing the system's function. 
the system retorted, its words resonating with a sharp sense of urgency. Even if, by some miracle, you manage to survive this crisis without my help, the user would still be stranded in a dangerous world without money, identity, or any prospects for the future. Not even a pair of shoes. My silence was a begrudging acceptance of these words, my eyes twitching with annoyance at the stark reality. Sooner or later, you'll either end up dead, begging on the streets, or in a prison cell. So, death, homelessness, or imprisonment. Fantastic options, I sighed in resignation, not particularly keen on delving deeper into the system's grim predictions. And you've got all the solutions to my life's problems, do you? I asked sarcastically, my tone dripping with annoyance. Negative. The universal network system encourages user independence and rewards exploration. I scoffed at its response, considering the utter chaos around me, but the system went on, seemingly unperturbed by my incredulous reaction. Originally, the tutorial function wasn't part of the system's features, but given the unexpected circumstances of your transmigration, it was added as an emergency function. The system explained, devoid of any concern for my predicament. Resigned to my fate, I let out a heavy sigh. All right, fine. I'll play along at least until I can figure out how to get out of this mess, I reluctantly agreed. But make no mistake, I don't trust a word you've said. I won't be your puppet, whatever your game is. I stated firmly. This is a one-time thing, just to get myself back on track, I concluded firmly. The system's response was composed, almost serene. That is entirely up to you, dear user. As long as you emerge unharmed from this situation, you are free to decide your course of action. A notification prompt popped up shortly after. However, I believe there's a significant misunderstanding regarding the purpose and functions of the system. I rolled my eyes in disbelief. Right, of course. I'm sure you had a perfectly altruistic, undisclosable reason for yanking me out of my cozy apartment and dumping me into a war zone, I retorted sarcastically. Let's just get this charade over with, I added with a hint of annoyance. Without hesitation, the system responded promptly. As you wish. Please provide your consent to initiate the tutorial. I shrugged nonchalantly. Fine. I consent to start the tutorial, I stated. As I finished speaking, the system's interface appeared before me, resembling the previous display. However, this time, all menu options were grayed out except for the point exchange. Soon, a new notification materialized in my vision. For the purpose of the tutorial, you've been granted 500 points. Please proceed to the point exchange menu to continue. Nodding to myself, I accessed the point exchange menu. Currently, only three options stood out, not grayed out and positioned at the top of the list. Points exchange. Available points, 500. Enhancements. Improved persuasion skill, 200 points. Mystery pair of shoes, crisis at Metropolis event limited item, 150 points. Metropolis city intel. Crisis at Metropolis Event Limited Item, 150 points. Checking out the options in the system menu, I got another notification interrupting my browsing fun. Please proceed to purchase the improved persuasion skill. I squinted at the screen, feeling a bit rebellious. Instead of following the system's orders, I decided to mess around a bit. I clicked on all the grayed out options, fully aware that it wouldn't change a thing. Surprise, surprise, nothing happened. Persistently, I kept on clicking, waiting for some kind of reaction from the system. After a bunch of futile clicks, the system responded with a message that was just a series of dots. Seriously? I couldn't help but smirk. Feeling satisfied with my victory of annoying the system, I went along with its original instruction. I hit the improved persuasion skill button and watched my points drop from 500 to 200 in a flash. Right after, another pop-up appeared. You have received the improved persuasion skill. Improved persuasion skill, have you ever wanted to sell ice to an Eskimo? Well, now you can. This nifty skill enhances your ability to persuade others by implanting muscle memory on how to sound more convincing. I think a gun would be more persuasive in this situation, but oh well. I muttered. This does sound useful. I added, and before I even began to imagine scenarios of how I would use this power, the system shattered my dreams. However, be warned. While it gives you the suave suitor vibes, it won't come up with the right words for you. You'll still need to dig up those silver-tongued phrases yourself. 
think of it as having all the slick moves for the dance floor but having to freestyle the actual dance routine. My face scrunched in disbelief at the description. Yet. Yeah. I'm sure my introverted, work-obsessed self will magically find the right words to make someone jump off a bridge if I wanted to, I muttered, my tone laced with irritation. Sure, I had a loud mouth and a knack for comebacks, but I mainly used my considerable gifts to annoy everyone around me. Charming people, tough? Not exactly my forte. The system, seemingly unfazed by my skepticism, pressed on with its instructions. I'm sure you'll manage. Please proceed to purchase the mystery pair of shoes. The state of my socks was lamentable enough, and the prospect of stepping on a glass shard and getting a tetanus infection was exactly appealing, so I didn't need to be told twice. Ha, tetanus. Funny how a word like tetanus could provoke both concern and a grin mature thoughts, indeed. Setting my immaturity aside, I went ahead and bought the mystery pair of shoes. Just as before, my available points vanished instantly as a mysterious box materialized on the ground before me from thin air. I eagerly tore open the cardboard box and found a pair of seemingly ordinary, uninspiring black sneakers. Lifting them up for a closer look, I couldn't help but chuckle at the unremarkable appearance. Lo and behold, a description of the item popped up on my system interface. Stormwalker Shoes these lackluster sneakers sport an electrifying twist providing the user immunity to shocking surprises by absorbing electricity and hoarding it like a battery. Oh, and they come with the ability of sniffing out electrical sources like a nosy neighbor snooping for gossip. Stored charges can be used to enhance your running speed and leap height, and any extra electricity will be safely channeled into the ground. Another system notification blinked, delivering a warning before I could even for my thoughts on the item. Disclaimer, while these shoes might make you speedier than the flash, if he was on a 99% sale, they won't turn you into a tank nor increase your brain's processing power. Chapter 4, First Quest Number 4 The Stormwalker Shoes, hey? That's an oddly specific set of skills, I mumbled to myself, arching an eyebrow as I perused the shoe's description. Still, I wasn't eager to tiptoe around barefoot, so I quickly slipped them on. The system, surprisingly patient, waited until I was suited up before hitting me with yet another notification prompt. Proceed to purchase the Metropolis City Intel, it commanded, and I complied without much thought, watching as my points dwindled to zero, and soon enough, another notification prompt appeared in my vision. Metropolis City Intel, get ready for one electrifying inside scoop. Due to the current chaos, the electrically charged villainous, Livewire, will soon escape from Superman's specially constructed imprisonment unit. Brace yourselves for her shocking return and imminent citywide rampage that will leave you spasming. This wouldn't have anything to do with these sneakers, would it? I muttered, feeling a tinge of unease. That's a bit too convenient for my taste, I grumbled to myself, noticing the ominous correlation between the intel and the pair of shoes. Just as I had begun to entertain the notion that the shoes and the intel might be somehow linked, the system didn't waste time proving me right as another prompt flashed before me. You have received a new quest, Zap and Influence. I squinted at the description that followed. Zap and Influence. Strap in for electrifying chaos. Livewire, the electrically charged villainess, is set to make a grand return, unleashing her shocking rampage across the city. Your mission? Influence her actions, whether it's persuading her to cease her chaos, aiding the heroes, or, well, adding a bit more mayhem to the mix. The more your actions shape this event and steer its course, the greater your rewards will be. Well, isn't this just peachy, really? The electric puns are just the cherry on top of the fucking cake. I muttered, both apprehensive and intrigued by the prospect of being thrown headfirst into the chaos. This damned system seemed to have a knack for turning a crisis into a personal odyssey. And I suppose I can't refuse the quest. I muttered to myself, wanting to be anywhere but here. Preferably back on my couch, sleeping this entire crazy situation off. The system wasted no time in replying. Under normal circumstances, you are free to accept or refuse any quests. Utilizing any and all system functions is not mandatory. However, to complete the tutorial and emerge from the crisis event unscathed, it's highly advisable that you accept and complete the quest. I couldn't contain the twitch in my eye. Oh, sure, easy for you to say. I scoffed. But how on this crazy earth am I supposed to waltz up to that electric lunatic without becoming her personal lightning rod? The system's retort was swift and irritatingly accurate. You're the comics-obsessed loner. You'll figure it out. There was not a second wasted before another prompt appeared in my vision. 
Would you like to accept the quest now? Yes slash no. I glared at the prompt, gritting my teeth, my frustration rising. Is this a fucking trick question? The no option is grayed out, you crappy text rectangle. I grumbled, my annoyance growing by the second. As the system persisted in pushing notifications in my face, would you like to accept the quest now? Yes slash no. Yup, you guessed it. The no option remained frustratingly inactive. With a resigned sigh, I succumbed and accepted the quest, only to be greeted by yet another insistent prompt, you have accepted the quest, zap and influence. Good luck. Though I wanted to keep complaining, I had a feeling that I wouldn't be getting any more replies, and arguing with a sassy text box didn't seem like the best investment of my time. I reluctantly decided to save my breath and instead focus on the task at hand dealing with Livewire. Okay. Livewire, I muttered to myself, racking my brains for any knowledge I had about this electrifying villainess. In the DC animated universe, she was a caustic shock jock who had nothing but disdain for Superman, criticizing his every move. Her life took a dramatic turn when she was struck by lightning during a confrontation with the Man of Steel at one of her rallies, giving her her abilities. In the original comics, she had a similar origin, except that she was born with the ability to control electricity. In an altercation atop the radio building where she worked, again with Superman, a bolt of lightning transformed her into a being of pure electrical energy. Then the infamous DC Comics reboot came along, and it was one wild roller coaster for Livewire. She went from a shock jock to a blogger with a thing for really bad pranks and barely any audience. Suddenly, out of the blue, she got the bright idea that pulling the switch for a citywide blackout in Metropolis would be a hilarious prank. Of course, Superman had to swoop in and save the day, but here's the kicker, somehow, the big guy failed to stop her from flipping that switch. I mean, seriously? He's a Kryptonian powered by Earth's yellow sun, capable of knocking down buildings with a flick of his finger and he couldn't stop a silly prankster. Comic book logic, I tell you. Then comes the fun part, the electricity from that power plant. Yeah, it zapped Livewire. Instead of turning her into a crispy critter, it gave her some seriously shocking powers. God damn it, now I'm using electric puns too. Anyway, that's comic books for you where mysterious accidents give you superpowers. Hell. I wouldn't be surprised if some poor soul got superpowers from a bout of explosive diarrhea in a public toilet or something along those lines. Dealing with Livewire sure seemed like a gamble. She's been through different reboots, but Leslie Willis was always the name on the marquee, with her knack for mischief and a lightning wit that didn't spare anyone. On top of that, she could turn someone into a human barbecue if they so much as rubbed her the wrong way. Powers-wise, she's the queen of electricity manipulation lightning bolts, power surges, you name it. But here's the kicker, her kryptonite wasn't some high-tech gadget, it was good OLH2O. A splash and zap, and she's out like a light. Now, how in the world was I supposed to wrangle her? Playing the diplomatic card seemed like the smarter move. I had these flashy shoes for safety, but I wasn't up for a round of superhero wrestling DC characters, be they villains or heroes, tended to suddenly develop super strength and proceed to beat the shit out of anyone standing in their way whenever their superpowers failed them. No way I was getting my ass beaten on my first day in this world. I prefer my ass rear end as it is, unbeaten and unkicked, thank you very much. So, let's see. Livewire, at her core, always had this insatiable need for the spotlight. Maybe I could stroke her ego a bit, pretend to be a fan or something, get her yapping, and from there, figure out which version of her I'm dealing with. Not the noblest plan, but when faced with a voltage happy villain. Diplomacy might just be the unsung hero. As soon as I wrapped my head around the first phase of my Livewire game plan, a tingling sensation shot up from my feet. The hair on my arms stood at attention. Uh oh, the electric sense tingling, I mumbled, realizing that it was probably the Stormwalker shoes kicking in, sensing the electrical activity around. Time to dive in. I muttered to myself, mustering all the courage I had and clenching my butt cheeks as I ventured toward the source of that electrifying feeling. The more I thought about it, the more I realized the necessity of dealing with Livewire. By that, I mean to have dealings with her and not any other meaning of the word, since we've already established that I had no intention of getting my ass kicked. I imagine bargaining with Livewire would be about as fun as a root canal. But hey, like any self-respecting DC villain she must have had connections in the underworld, right? Contacts who could forge an identity for a guy who magically plopped into Metropolis during an invasion. And trust me, 
explaining that you're a random guy from another dimension who just happened to land here? Yeah, that wouldn't fly even in the weirdest of comic book scenarios. Chapter 5, Livewire's Grand Entrance So there I was, jogging through the chaos-ridden streets of Metropolis, ducking behind corners and dodging the superhero showdowns and alien invasions like I was trying to dodge a raging bull, which was an understatement since they were probably way more dangerous than some dumb farm animal. I made sure to keep myself hidden, steering clear of anyone who looked like they could throw a punch or shoot laser beams from their eyes. I mean, who wants to be collateral damage in a superhero brawl on their first day on the job, if you can even call it that? I did my best to slink around unnoticed, but in the middle of this utter chaos, you never knew if someone had their eyes on you. The street corner I stumbled upon was just your average mess, if you discount the flipped over cars, the ground craters that looked like they could swallow you whole, and the eerie absence of life thanks to everyone hightailing it or cowering in hiding. Casually slipping into a nearby shop, I took a minute to scan the surroundings, eyes peeled for any sign of live wire. This was ground zero for that prickling sensation of electricity that led me here, after all. Then, right on cue, the crossing lights started flickering like they were having an electric seizure, and the wires above began spitting out these wild, frenzied sparks. Before I could say what the heck, one of those crackling bolts shot up and landed with a zapping sound, morphing into a woman right before my eyes. She sported a cool light blue skin tone that matched her short, spiky hair, decked out in a snug black leotard and thigh-high boots that could probably kick a hole through a brick wall. I suddenly found myself wide-eyed, staring at Livewire the very woman I'd been trying to track down amidst the chaotic metropolis. As soon as she emerged, she was throwing her own personal victory party, hooting and fist-pumping like she'd just won the lottery. Free at last. That super jerk is so going to get it. She yelled, an odd mix of excitement and seething anger. Figuring it was as good a time as any to make my presence known, I called out, Miss Willis. Her head snapped towards me faster than a lightning strike, her hands crackling with menacing electricity. I go by live wire now, pal, she retorted, a clear hint of annoyance in her tone. Who are you anyway? Her eyes glinted, giving me the impression that my answer could result in a shocking experience. I tried to play it cool. Ah, my bad. Live wire, then, I corrected myself, throwing my hands up in a gesture of surrender. It's just that I'm a big fan, so I couldn't help but blurt out your old name, I admitted, punctuating my words with a nervous chuckle. Livewire's crackling fury dimmed as I admitted to being a fan of her old radio show. A fan of my old radio talk show, are you? She mused a flicker of satisfaction across her face. It's good to see there are still people with common sense and good taste in this city. Radio talk show, hey. I must be dealing with an iteration of the DC animated universe. I mused to myself. Before I could respond, she abruptly declared, Anyway, it's been a blast meeting me, I'm sure. I'd sign your shirt or something, but I've got a city to shake up and a super jerk's brain to fry. With a dramatic swish, she turned, arcs of electricity trailing her like an eerie aura, preparing to make her grand exit. In a moment of panic, I blurted out, wait. That probably won't end well for you. Her sudden pivot towards me, electric fury in her eyes, made my heart race. Now look here, you might be my fan, but that doesn't mean I won't zap you stupid. Livewire warned her tone direct and uncompromising. I'll let you off the hook just this time, so you better keep your mouth shut and admire me from afar. Her disapproving gaze seemed to punctuate her final words. I winced inwardly at the thought of being zapped, despite the protective promise of the Stormwalker shoes. The idea of becoming an involuntary lightning rod was not high on my list of preferred experiences. But letting Livewire simply stroll off in a bid to terrorize the city wasn't my idea of a best-case scenario either. Zap me if you must. Just, just hear me out first, I stated, attempting to maintain composure despite the nerves buzzing beneath my skin. If you don't like what I say, then do whatever you want. Livewire's initial frown morphed into a sly smile, clearly finding some entertainment in the situation. All right, I'll listen, but just a heads up I'm gonna zap you anyway for wasting my time, she declared, her voice tinged with amusement. So, spill it. What do you want to say? Her arms crossed an unmistakable air of playful challenge in her demeanor. I could practically sense Livewire's eagerness to zap me coursing through the air. It seemed my attempt at reasoning with a maniacal villain might have been wishful thinking on my part. That's what I get, I suppose. Still, I kept my thoughts in check, maintaining a sheepish grin. 
Look over there, please, I calmly directed, pointing behind the villainess. She chuckled, clearly enjoying the situation. You're not planning a speedy escape, are you? You know I can catch you, she taunted, a mischievous glint in her eyes. Although chasing you around might be fun for a moment or two. I restrained the twitch in my eye, refusing to be belittled. Honestly, did I look like a Looney Tunes character to this bitch? I'm not that stupid. Just look, I replied, hoping Livewire would oblige my request. Luckily, she turned around, her interest peaked. Following my indication, she squinted at an innocuous fire hydrant. It's a fire hydrant, what about it? She queried, a mix of confusion and curiosity evident as she turned back to face me. Gathering my courage, I braced myself and responded, if you go after Superman right now, you won't last more than a few minutes before you are drenched by one of those and put in cuffs. I stated, and Livewire's face soured instantly at my words. I was just going to give you a slap on the wrist, but you must have a death wish, talking to me like that, you punk. She snarled through clenched teeth, the sparks around her body crackling with intensified ferocity. I'll turn your insides into mush. I quickly intervened, trying to reason with the electrically charged villain. You said you'd hear me out, and I'm not done yet. I exclaimed urgently. Livewire paused her threatening actions, looking visibly irritated. At the very least, you should stick to your word. I insisted, knowing that for all her faults, Livewire kept her word at least. Her eyes shot me a piercing glare as if my existence alone offended her. Fine. I'll let you talk, but for every word you utter, that'll be another extra 10,000 volts of electricity frying your brain. She declared with venom. As I stood there, facing Livewire's seething wrath, my impulsive tongue decided to take the reins. Oh yeah? Then maybe I should just keep talking until you die of old age. The words slipped out with a smirk that faded into instant remorse. An arc of electricity shot from Livewire's hand, striking a nearby car and erupting it into a fiery explosion, hence why my smugness deflated as quickly as the car combusted and flew into the air. Don't push your luck. Livewire's voice crackled with menace, her narrowed eyes amplifying the danger. Internally, I gulped, but outwardly, I attempted to maintain an air of composure. Jesus, learn to take a joke, will you? I tried to defuse the tension, only to witness Livewire's scowl deepen. Sweet talking clearly wasn't my forte. Look, what I mean is Superman's nearly untouchable. You're strong, sure, but he knows how to exploit your weaknesses. I lifted my hands in a conciliatory gesture, hoping to navigate this conversation without getting zapped. Yeah, he's got his flaws, but kryptonite isn't exactly sitting on every street corner like tap water. I added, trying to reason with her. I knew that appealing to her rational side might be a stretch, but I had to soften her up before delivering the sale pitch. Much to my relief, Livewire paused for a moment, as if weighing my words. However, her contemplative expression vanished almost as swiftly as it appeared, replaced by a deeper frown. You sure seem to know a lot come to think of it, how did you even recognize me? And how exactly do you know about my weakness? Her narrowed eyes bore into me, demanding answers. Who are you really? Most importantly, what the hell do you really want? I sensed the tension in her voice, the crackling energy poised to strike if my response didn't meet her expectations. Her suspicion was warranted and I needed to tread carefully to navigate this conversation while keeping my ass in its mint, unkicked state. Chapter 6, Shocking Plan Feeling a sense of control over the conversation, I couldn't help but grin confidently. My name's Micah Foster, as for how I know all this, I just do, I stated calmly, trying to maintain an air of mystery. You can even say that knowing things I have no business knowing is my whole bread and butter. I added, gesturing dramatically with my arms for effect. I even know that you plan to team up with Parasite to take on Superman and that he'll double-cross you with a taste of your power as compensation, I added, watching Livewire's face closely. In the end, he'll get impatient and handsy at a critical moment, double-cross you, and both of you will be back in the can faster than you can say kryptonite. I concluded, speaking in a matter-of-fact tone. Her expression shifted like a fast-forward movie real confusion gave way to shock, which morphed into seething anger, and then settled into a blank look as if she couldn't quite process the situation. I was riding the wave of this interaction, relishing every second of discomfort I seemed to be causing her. One might say I was counting my chickens before they hatched, maybe being a bit too overconfident, 
but I found myself surprisingly enjoying the thrilling rush of the moment. Livewire picked up on my amusement, her dissatisfaction brewing visibly as she gritted her teeth. Fine, let's pretend I buy into this all-knowing act for now, she spat out, her narrowed eyes expressing skepticism. But you're dancing around the point. What's your game here? Her cautious tone suggested she was reassessing my significance, upgrading me from just an amusing bystander to a possible asset or a threat, which was a step in the right direction. Now I only needed to persuade her that it was in her best interest to see me as the former. I think too knowing would be a better description, but let's leave that aside for now, I responded, maintaining my grin while subtly acknowledging her implied threat. You see, I find myself in a peculiar situation, one where the help of a God-fearing villainous with the right connections and power would be invaluable, naturally, I'm not asking for a free lunch, I added with a nonchalant shrug, trying to exude an air of confidence. Live wire mold over my proposition before probing further. And what exactly are you offering me? She inquired, her tone suggesting a hint of interest while still being cautious. I took a breath, gathering my thoughts before speaking. It's not about what I can offer you, but more about what you truly desire. I calmly began, needing a moment to structure my argument. Livewire's impatience was evident as she tapped her foot, arms crossed, demanding, I'm listening. Get to the point. Let's talk about your thing, Livewire the whole electricity bit, I said, aiming to keep her engaged. Your focus has been on taking down Superman, but it will always end the same way. You're taken out, put in the big house, and we're back to square one. Rinse and repeat. But does it have to be that way? I probed, hoping to nudge her toward considering an alternative. Livewire scoffed at my words. So what? You're suggesting I hang up the old form-fitting costume and stop using my powers. She said, her tone dripped with disbelief. Better yet, maybe you want me to join the do-gooders, and waste my life helping some schmuck I've never met. She added in a dismissive tone as if the very idea was the epitome of ridiculousness. I shook my head in mild exasperation at Livewire's dismissive attitude. God forbid that you do, I replied, rolling my eyes. It doesn't have to be one extreme or the other. There are other ways to use your powers beyond fixating on the big boy scout or aiding those in need. Livewire chuckled a hint of sarcasm in her voice. Oh, I'm sure you're about to enlighten me on all the possibilities, she said mockingly. Ask, and ye shall receive, I retorted with a grin. You want the spotlight, right? You want Metropolis to know you're a force to be reckoned with. Well, there's a way to achieve without picking fights with a guy who wears undies over his pants at every given chance and wrecking the city while you're at it. I cleared my throat and continued. The city of Metropolis offers many opportunities for someone with your talents I can teach you to seize every last one of them. As Livewire quirked an eyebrow, she challenged me, her tone daring. That all sounds peachy, but aren't you forgetting something? You know, like the fact that I'm a convicted supervillainess, the only reason I'm standing here is that I managed to escape prison, she stated, a challenging look on her face as if she'd just put me in a tight spot. True but we'll just have to work on getting you acquitted, won't we? I responded, a grin spreading across my face. Livewire didn't seem impressed, judging by her stoic expression. Public opinion and perspective can be a powerful tool, capable of turning even the most heinous criminals into public heroes if wielded correctly. I asserted confidently. And take a look around you. There's a perfect opportunity for someone like you to change their public image, you know. What with the army of weirdos wreaking havoc in the city and what have you, I added, performing my best carpet salesman impression. Livewire paused, glancing around at the chaotic scene, observing the disparate army of bizarre villains wreaking havoc. All that time in the kin must have done a number on me. She sighed. Fine. I'll work with you for now, but if I find out you're trying to double or unable to deliver your sales pitch. Livewire warned, trailing off as she extended both hands electricity crackling at her palms. You'll zap me stupid. Trust me, we've already covered that, I retorted, rolling my eyes. Now, pay attention. High above the metropolis skyline, amidst the ongoing battle, the spectacle of heroes and invaders clashed in a whirlwind of chaos. Superman, a beacon of hope, darted through the fray with astonishing speed, effortlessly neutralizing threats and safeguarding civilians. His red cape fluttered heroically behind him as he rescued a stranded boy, reuniting him with his anxious mother below. Amidst the flurry of action, Superman's keen eyesight caught a menacing sight a robotic invader targeting a building where numerous civilians had sought refuge. 
without hesitation, the robot raised its arm, readying an ominous attack aimed directly at the shelter. Recognizing the imminent danger, the Man of Steel streaked toward the building, his flight swift as the wind. However, before he could reach the assailant, a sudden bolt of crackling electricity intercepted the robot. The singular jolt halted the machine in its tracks, momentarily stunning it. Amidst the chaos, Superman watched with incredulity as the robotic invader diverted its aim from the building to target another intruder a demonic creature with emerald scales sneaking up on Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern. The robot's arm whirred, releasing a pulsating blue energy bolt that struck the scaled creature square in the back, causing it to plummet to the ground. A chain reaction began. Electric surges erupted, cascading across the battlefield like a storm. The sparking bolts of electricity swirled through the air, infecting the robotic invaders and turning them against their own ranks. Each bolt created a chaotic display, zapping the machines and setting off a strange domino effect across the battlefield. Suddenly, every intact screen within the city flickered to life, live wires smirking face dominating the displays. Her grin exuded a sense of smug confidence as she addressed the entire city with unwavering authority. Hello, Metropolis. Live wire here, ready to save the day. Her voice echoed through the cityscape, amplified by the hijacked screens. I've taken control of a good portion of our unwanted guests and I plan to herd those funky-looking enemies fellows to the eastern side of the city. She laid out a plan with an air of calculated assurance. For now, I need all of you to head toward the western side where it's safer. Let the do-gooder capers handle these intruders while my army of robotic minions and I keep your side of town safe. Her directives were firm, and the broadcast concluded promptly after she finished speaking. Then, as the broadcast ended, the robotic invaders split into two groups, one attacking the other unwanted guests. The other moved toward the ground, attempting to guide the civilians to the safety of the city's western side. Chapter 7, Propaganda Amidst the chaos, Hal Jordan floated toward Superman, his expression a mix of confusion and concern. What's happening here? He asked trying to make sense of the situation. Superman turned toward Hal with a troubled countenance. She's one of yours, right? This live wire character, I mean. What's your take on her? Hal Jordan inquired, trying to gather more information. With a sigh, Superman elaborated, I know she took advantage of the chaos to escape and come after me. I overheard a young man trying to talk some sense into her, and I honestly didn't think much of it. He paused contemplating his own assessment of the situation. I thought he'd only managed to distract her for a minute or two, and I was ready to get him out of there, but it seems I thought too little of the young man. Superman's expression shifted to reflect a tinge of introspection. Raising an eyebrow at Superman's capabilities, Hal muttered, Super hearing sure is convenient, albeit a bit unnerving. He shook his head, slightly taken aback by the revelation. Still, can she be trusted? Will she protect the civilians as promised? Hal Jordan inquired, seeking assurance in the midst of uncertainty. Superman nodded in response. It appears so. Livewire may have her quirks, but she seems to stick to her word for the most part. His tone carried a sense of reluctant acknowledgement. If she doesn't hold up her end, then I'll deal with her once we've restored order, Superman declared firmly, displaying his determination to maintain order and protect the city at all costs. As Superman revealed his intentions to Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern flashed a knowing smile. Guess it's a case of not looking a gift horse in the mouth, hey? He remarked, prompting a nod from the Man of Steel in agreement. In that case, I'll contain those pesky fellows with a light barrier once they're pushed into the city's eastern side, Hal explained, clenching his fist as his power ring surged. It wasn't feasible given how spread out they were, but now it's manageable. Although I won't be able to keep fighting, so that's where I'll bow out and leave it to you and the rest, he concluded, emphasizing the limitations of his action. Thanks, Hal, Superman expressed his gratitude with a nod, readying himself for the task ahead. Once this is taken care of, let's grab a bite to eat. He turned and flew swiftly toward the eastern quadrant of Metropolis, his voice trailing behind. Hal chuckled at Superman's departing words, watching the Man of Steel soar into action against the chaos. It'll be your treat through. He called out, his voice echoing through the skirmish as Superman vanished into the distance. In some bland companies, the name of which I couldn't be bothered to remember, Dark CCTV Room, I couldn't help but roll my eyes at Livewire. There she was, kicking back on a stool, legs up on the console table, watching these edited clips of herself with this insufferable smirk plastered across her face. 
the screen in front of her looped videos showcasing her fake heroic feats images of herself swooping in, rescuing civilians from robotic assailants, all with an unmistakably smug grin. The central CCTV display featured live wire soaring into the sky, putting her electric powers on display and manipulating the remaining machines, turning them against their comrades. In truth, other than the footage playing on the central screen, the rest were all as fake as a Kardashian's rear end, and I know because captured each and every one of them. I cooked up this whole scheme where Livewire would pretend to save folks from robot attacks when she was the one to incite them in the first place to garner gratitude and admiration from the people before taking control of the entire swarm. It was a pretty shady move, I'll admit. But hey, nobody got hurt, and these fake heroics were our ticket to clearing Livewire's name when this whole mess wrapped up. Besides, I was having way too much fun to care. These shenanigans beat listening to my boss complain about improper wording in business emails for hours on end and preaching the importance of corporate solidarity any time of the day, any day of the week. As I pondered the situation, Livewire's lively voice cut through my thoughts. So, what's the master plan, genius? She quipped, her gaze fixed on me, eager for answers. Well, that's a change in tone if I've ever seen one, this is kind of too easy. I thought to myself deciding to keep that observation to myself. Right now, your priority is to get these videos everywhere. Let the whole world see your heroics before they even catch wind of the metropolis mayhem, I calmly explained instead. Livewire arched an eyebrow. Already on it. I'm not clueless, you know. She retorted, her tone tinged with annoyance. But what's next? You pitched this to me as a bigger plan than just a quick pardon, she probed, seeking more insight into the bigger picture. I let out a sigh and glanced sideways at Livewire. Do I come across as an idiot to you? I deadpanned. This is a mutual deal, not one where I sketch out your future and you vanish, leaving me with zilch for my trouble, I asserted firmly. Is that so? Livewire responded, more entertained by my words than anything else. And if I fancy renegotiating our little arrangement? She inquired, narrowing her eyes. Then you'll get nothing more from me. See how long your clean record lasts before Superman carts you back to prison, I retorted with a scoff. You want the spotlight? You want the world to adore you? Help me out, and I'll help you channel your talents effectively. Otherwise, we're done here, I declared firmly. Letting live wire slip away from my grasp would be a pity, but my quest was to steer her actions enough to divert the crisis events course, which I've achieved. I didn't need her to fabricate an identity. I could likely acquire one from the system using quest points. While I'd prefer not to waste those points on such a mundane matter when I can get a new identity from Livewire on account of her contacts, I had no intention of becoming a personal assistant to some second-rate, edgy DC villainous. Seeing as she had no response other than a careless shrug, I shifted my attention away from Livewire, aiming to refocus on my plans for a brighter future. But just as I settled into my thoughts, a system notification jolted me back to the present, the Stormwalker's shoes charge has increased by 2%. A momentary confusion swept over me until I noticed electric arcs swirling around my torso. I didn't need to be a level 9 intellect to realize that Livewire had finally fulfilled her promise of zapping me. Whirling around to face her, my expression must have been baleful. What's the big idea? I asked, putting on my best Professor Snape impression. Calm down, you big baby, Livewire interjected looking surprisingly composed and even entertained. It was just a tiny zap to test where all that bravado was coming from, she explained, her tone more thoughtful than apologetic. Guess it wasn't unfounded. You didn't feel a thing, did you? Her narrowed eyes bore into mine, assessing my reaction. In a calculated move, I sized up live wire. Seems she's not just a pretty face, I thought. Acknowledging her test with a slight zap the Stormwalker shoes charge wouldn't go up by a measly 2% if she put any effort into it. She was basically gauging my reaction, probing to see if she could assert control over me through intimidation. If I'd shown fear, she might have pushed further, as it stood, she chose to play it off like a harmless prank. Still, this wasn't the worst turn of events, far from it actually. It was a golden opportunity a chance to establish my boundaries and make it clear that she couldn't rattle me. You think I'd walk up to a human lightning bolt without precautions? I retorted, fixing live wire with an intense stare. Don't try testing me again. It won't go your way, I warned, making it evident that I meant business. Sure thing, boss man, live wire replied with a mocking tone, though there was a discernible hint of caution in her demeanor. 
So, again, I ask, what's our next move? She asked, crossing her arms. Now, we find a good lawyer, can't have you handling your own case, can we? I quipped with a chuckle, aiming to defuse the tension. That'd be a catastrophe waiting to happen. Chapter 8, Reward Superman's red cape billowed in the wind as he brought down the final robotic invader. With swift precision, he launched the metallic assailant high into the sky, where it was encased within a formidable Iron Maiden-like green energy construct. The contraption carried the invader far into space, headed straight for the Justice League's watchtower, leaving the Man of Steel to survey the city below. Metropolis lay in disarray, the aftermath of yet another destructive altercation. Superman's furrowed brow mirrored his deep concern as he beheld the devastation below. It wasn't the first time the city had endured such turmoil, and he knew it likely wouldn't be the last. Nevertheless, this time, the heroes had managed to avert any tragic loss of life. Chin up, Clark, Hal Jordan remarked, a smile touching his lips as he offered a reassuring pat on Superman's broad shoulder. Luther will be all over this. He loves to flaunt his supposed goodwill, and as much as I hate to admit it, he'll have Metropolis looking as good as new in no time, Hal added, a light chuckle escaping him. Don't I know it, Superman responded, a faint smile breaking through his concerned expression. He knew all too well of Lex Luthor's inclination to exploit any chance to showcase his benevolence, often using his wealth and advanced technology to refurbish the city's damaged facade. Superman shifted the conversation's focus to a more pressing matter, turning to Hal Jordan with a hint of concern edged across his features. Do you have any clue about these entities? Any idea where they came from? He queried in his composed demeanor. Hal Jordan shook his head regretfully, his expression thoughtful. No luck. Their signatures don't match any entries in the Guardian's database, he explained, a sense of uncertainty coloring his words. If I had to wager, I'd say they're off-worlders. And I don't mean your typical extraterrestrial visitors. His tone shifted, taking a more serious note. Superman's brow furrowed in response. What does the Green Lantern Handbook say about dealing with these, off-worlders? He asked, his expression concerned. Standard procedure, really, Hal replied with a shrug. Attempt to negotiate if they're open to it. Detain them if things turn hostile, he explained matter-of-factly. Treat them as you would any other criminal, I guess. But what matters most is figuring out what brought them here and ensuring it doesn't happen again, Hal added, emphasizing the critical nature of the situation. Sounds quite daunting, Superman mused with a slight win C.E. This is beyond my expertise. Can I trust you to handle it? He inquired with an apologetic tone, acknowledging his limitations in this unfamiliar territory. No sweat. Part of the job description, Hal reassured him with a confident nod. I'll use the ring scanners, sniff around, and dig up what I can. I'll get back to you with any leads, he promised, already activating his power ring, ready to delve into the investigation. Thanks again, Hal. Superman said with a grateful nod. In the meantime, I'll see what scheme Livewire is trying to brew, or if she's really had a change of heart. The Man of Steel's expression was unreadable as he turned toward the army of robotic invaders, still under the electric villainous's control as they gathered inside the stadium at the center of the city. I stood before the security console, glued to the live battle footage Livewire was facilitating. Her powers were a boon in monitoring the skirmish. I glanced at the electrical villainous, and she met my gaze with a knowing grin. Seems like things are winding down, she remarked, her attention shifting between me and the screens. What's the next move? She inquired, anticipation in her voice. I nodded in acknowledgement. Once the last of those invaders is contained, round them up the tin cans and have them gather in a football stadium, I instructed. Livewire arched an eyebrow, clearly puzzled by the directive. Superman and the heroes will want an explanation that's where we'll give them one. I clarified. Livewire let out a chuckle at my plan. Making the do-gooders come to us and showing them who's in charge, eh? Her grin widened with excitement. I'm on board with that, she agreed. The blue glow of electric arcs danced around her as she channeled her commands to the controlled robotic invaders through the nearest power outlet. Good, now, give me a moment, will you? I need to clear my head, I requested. Livewire eyed me suspiciously for a beat before shrugging and striding toward the room's exit. I watched Livewire leave the room, shutting the door firmly behind her. With a pocket knife in hand, I made my way over to the power outlet, aiming to cut the room's power and check the system without the risk of Livewire spying on me. 
Now, let me be clear I had no clue what I was doing. There was a high probability of getting zapped, but with the Stormwalker shoes on, getting electrocuted wasn't a major concern. If anything, I was counting on it to juice up the shoes. Two birds with one stone, or jolt in this case, Amirite, fellas? I pried open the outlet with the knife, which I picked up along the way for self-defense, wasting no time in hacking through the exposed wires. Lo and behold, the inevitable happened I got a jolt of electricity that was probably strong enough to knock out an elephant. Surprisingly, it wasn't particularly painful or uncomfortable. Sure, my hair stood on end, but otherwise, I felt nothing. I won't bore you with the intricate details, but I went the whole nine yards digging through the wall to track down those wires and snipping them until the room plunged into darkness. That should do the trick, I muttered to myself, finally able to access the system's interface. Instantly, a notification popped up in front of me. Congratulations! You've completed the, zap and influence, quest with a stellar performance. I nodded in contentment and swiped the notification away, only to be greeted by another one. You've been rewarded with 195 points for completing the, zap and influence, quest. Notifications kept pouring in one confirming the tutorial's completion, others updating the status of the Stormwalker shoes charge. But then, there came one that caught me off guard. It wasn't a notification per se, it felt more like a cheeky comment. Color me impressed, dear user. I didn't expect you to breeze through the tutorial so swiftly, all while steering clear of conflicts. Seeing this, I couldn't help but purse my lips in annoyance. Oh great, you're back. I muttered, referring to the snarky being whatever or whoever it was likely responsible for whisking me away from my comfy couch and landing me in this situation. Unfazed by my annoyance, the cheeky being piped up. No need to be so cold, dear user. I'm here to say goodbye since this would mark the last conversation we'll ever have. Our interactions were only a result of the unfortunate circumstances that accompanied your transmigration. I couldn't help but crack a grin at those words. Good riddance, I quipped, feeling a surge of relief at the thought of parting ways with the impish entity. But, of course, it didn't end there. The being chimed in yet again. What's more, I'm going to deliver you a special gift as a reward for your stellar performance and an apology for this entire situation. Hopefully, this will put your mind at ease, dear user. My interest was piqued. A gift? What kind of gift are we talking about here? I asked curiosity tinged with a dash of greed at the prospect. The reply came swiftly as if whispered by some D&D devil. A very special gift, a companion called the Regent of the Swarm. It's an interdimensional creature that would usually set you back tens of thousands of points in the system shop. Hopefully, it will make your stay in this world more pleasant. An interdimensional being that costs tens of thousands of points. I exclaimed, my excitement clearer than the sun. If this companion thingy lives up to the hype, consider us even. Hand it over, and we'll call it all water under the bridge, I said, my impatience evident. The being quickly responded with words materializing in the text box. Very well. A notification will soon arrive, finalizing the delivery of your reward. Farewell and good luck, dear user. Almost instantly, those words transformed into a notification prompt. You have been granted the, Regent of the Swarm, Companion by Administrator, Zafod Beeblebrox. Would you like to accept the reward right now? Yes slash no. Zafod what now? I muttered, not bothering to even try pronouncing the cheeky bastard's last name. I didn't dwell on it as my excitement for the reward soon took over, and I turned my attention back to the notification. Hell yeah, I want to accept the reward right now. Chapter 9, Radigan. So, I tapped that accept button, and whoosh. This blinding light decided to crash the darkness party, turning the room from a black hole to something brighter than a supernova. I squinted, trying to shield my eyes, and then it hit me like a mental brick. Hold up, how big was this thing again? I threw my question out to the system, but it was radio silence, which only cranked up my anxiety. Whoa. Wait. Change of plans. I don't want the reward right now. I shouted into the void, hoping for a smidgen of response. But you guessed it zilch. And now, cue the escalating freak-out mode. Imagining this regent of the swarm as some mammoth-sized, room-demolishing entity was all too easy. I mean, come on, with a name like that. It's not painting a picture of a tiny teacup poodle, is it? 
I was busy contemplating potential squishiness while it rearranged the room meaning reduced it to rubble and maybe decided to add the entire building to its to-do list, which was the least of my concerns. Legal issues like being sued for damages while being more broke than a New York bum? Nah, being pancaked into oblivion seemed a tad more urgent. Time ticked by at a slug's pace, and I braced myself, waiting for the arrival of whatever colossal disaster was RSVPing to my party. The suspense was killing me well, figuratively, at least. I crossed my fingers, hoping my imagination had exaggerated this impending catastrophe. I let out a sigh of relief as the blinding light started shrinking down, but my relief didn't last long. Wait, isn't it getting a bit too small? I grumbled, my feelings fluctuating between relief, irritation, and frustration. Seriously, call me picky, but this roller coaster of light drama was pushing my patience to its limit. Someone had to be messing with me, right? I mean, how else could you explain the whole supernova shrinking to be barely bigger than my fist? Moderation, anyone? The light seemed completely unfazed by my turbulent emotions, going through this color change show from white to golden, which, under different circumstances, might have seemed like a promising turn. But not today. I wasn't falling for any cosmic trickery. Suppressing my urge to channel my inner hulk and smash something, I kept my eyes glued to the light, sporting my best poker face. It was hard, I tell you. Finally, the golden light started fading, and in its place, this teeny silhouette started emerging. It was small, smaller than a house pet but larger than an insect. The anticipation was killing me. And then, with a last flash that almost seared my retinas, poof. The light vanished, leaving behind this odd little critter perched on the security console. I blinked, stared, and blinked again. A rat, blooming bigger than usual, mind you. But still, a rat, dressed in what looked like a royal red cape with fur trimmings, little pants, and a tiny jeweled crown. A friggin' rat. The fuck is this? I wasn't sure if I should be laughing my head off or throwing it across the room. I mean, seriously? All that hype for a rodent in regal attire? Talk about a cosmic anticlimax. The notification popped up in my vision, courtesy of the system as if it was poking fun at my predicament. The regent of the swarm, a quirky, interdimensional species possessing unparalleled mental prowess, capable of bending the wills of most beings, except those with the resolve of a steel fortress. Its true form is beyond the comprehension of regular mortals, hence it assumes the shape of a creature native to the world it manifests in. However, this clever imitation comes with a catch, it can only dominate members of the species it impersonates. Great. So, this supposedly all-powerful being, capable of dominating minds, ended up looking like a rodent that couldn't dominate its own bowl movements, let alone anyone else. Talk about an underwhelming cosmic surprise. I sighed in defeat, turning once more to face the disappointing sight of the little rat-like creature. It stood proudly on its hind legs, wearing that smug expression that made me want to grind my teeth. Its tiny paw extended in an almost princely gesture, demanding a hand kiss, or so it seemed. My brow began twitching erratically in annoyance. I'll give you a kiss all right, you pesky little. I grumbled under my breath, my hand slowly reaching toward the critter's paw as if I were about to pay some courtesy. But at the very last moment, I decided otherwise, flicking its little face with my finger. The creature's reaction was priceless. It reeled back, looking thoroughly affronted as if I had committed a cardinal sin. Then, unexpectedly, it lunged forward and nipped at my hand. The pain shot up my arm like lightning, and let me tell you, it stung worse than a hundred bee stings combined. That's it, you've officially crossed the line, you oversized rodent. I exclaimed, shaking my throbbing hand in the air, half expecting it to have transformed into something monstrous. Instead, it remained the same just a bit more painful and slightly red. The rat seemed to puff up its chest, feeling quite proud of itself for the sneak attack. It stood there, wiggling its whiskers with an air of self-importance, seemingly unaffected by my outburst. The audacity of this creature. It certainly had an uncanny ability to ruffle feathers. Seriously? This is what the system thought would make my stay more pleasant. I muttered incredulously, eyeing the rat, which now seemed to be eyeing me back with a mix of curiosity and haughtiness. While I was expecting some majestic, interdimensional being, I got a regal rat with an attitude problem. Figures. But then again, it wasn't the rat's fault, it was the faulty description and mismatched expectations. I took a step back, a bit more wary now. All right, your highness, 
let's get a few things straight here, I said, adopting a mockingly regal tone, mimicking the rat's haughty expression. You may be some mystical being from who knows where, but you can't just bite people without a warning. The rat seemed unfazed by my words, simply grooming itself nonchalantly, as if my complaints were nothing more than a passing breeze. It was clear this creature wasn't going to win any awards for diplomatic behavior. I sighed, trying to calm my nerves. Look, I don't know what your deal is, but I've got enough problems without adding having a demanding rat as a sidekick to the list, I grumbled, more to myself than to the rat. I took a minute to figure out what to do with this little troublemaker, but I just had to drop the whole idea. Seriously, this was the worst timing, especially with the Superman meeting on the horizon. Hey, little dude. I can't deal with you right now, okay? I sighed, rubbing my head in frustration. The rat cocked its head, giving me a curious look, almost like it wanted me to keep talking. I've got this weird situation outside and a meeting with a guy who could flick me into the next galaxy, so how about we call a truce until things settle down? I proposed, hoping it understand. It took a moment, then nodded slightly, which made me breathe a sigh of relief. Awesome, now, I just need a second to check out what I can snag with these points. I muttered, about to pull up the system's shop, but the rat had other ideas. It started chittering away, seemingly protesting my plans. What is it you want now, rat? I grumbled under my breath, giving the rat a side eye as it continued its wild chittering, flailing its little arms around like it was performing a Shakespearean play. For a moment, I was very much lost, but then it suddenly clicked, almost subconsciously this rodent was demanding a name. Of course, because why not add Chief Namer to my list of stellar talents? Oh, you want a name, hey? I huffed, and the rat nodded with such enthusiasm it was almost annoying. Name giving wasn't exactly my forte, but I guess here we were, trying to brainstorm a name for a rodent with an attitude. How about Mr. Poopy Butthole? I suggested with a smirk half-joking. The rat's reaction? Let's just say it looked downright insulted, chittering even more fervently, as if to say, are you kidding me? Okay, tough crowd, how about Sir Squeaks a lot? I offered, and the rat's response was an immediate and very definite nope. Great. My track record with names was a solid zero. I continued to suggest many names, such as, Snickerdoodle McSqueak, Whiskerworth 3, Lord Cheesebiter, and Sir Cheddar Chunks, all of which didn't seem to match the rat's royal expectations, until we finally found some common ground. All right, how about Radigan? I suggested with a shrug, not expecting much. Surprisingly, the rat seemed to ponder that for a second, then nodded in approval. Radigan it is, then, I declared, almost impressed with myself. Radigan it sounded regal enough for a rat wearing what looked like a royal getup. I guess that settled that, I had a truce and a rat with a name. Now, back to browsing that system shop for some much-needed upgrades. Chapter 10, Cruel Twist of Fate Now, let's take a look at what's cooking here, I mumbled to myself, summoning the system's interface and diving straight into the shop section. The points I had in the bank, a paltry 195, stared back at me, earned solely for breezing through that quest like it was a piece of cake. Gotta admit, that number made me a tad suspicious. I had this inkling that fate would cruelly pull the rug from under me, leaving me five points short of something crucial that I'd desperately need. I couldn't shake off the feeling that the system designers were having a grand OL time messing with my expectations. Classic cosmic humor. But hey, no time for dwelling on suspicions. I was on a mission, find some mental shielding powers, pronto. As a visitor from another dimension packing memories of stuff that hadn't even happened here yet, Strutting around without mental protection was a one-way ticket to Disasterville. Population, me and this world. Just imagine what some nefarious, telepathic cuntbag could do with all the juicy information in my head, secret identities, future knowledge, and all kinds of shindigs that could topple countries. So, I jumped right into the shop's lists, my sights locked on that much-needed mental shielding. The shop was a smorgasbord of strange and fascinating abilities all kinds of superpowers, magical artifacts, weapons, gadgets, and even one-time use items. Ugh, this is getting tedious, I muttered to myself, scrolling through the shop's offerings. My patience dwindled until, hallelujah, I stumbled upon a search filter. How did I miss that gem earlier? Nevertheless, better late than never. I punched in the keywords, filtering for mental-related superpowers. The list was a smorgasbord of extraordinary abilities telepathy, 
telekinesis, mind-altering marvels, you name it. Amidst this mental melange, I found a glimmer of hope a brain-shielding power. But guess what? Fate's cosmic joke strikes again. The brain-protecting superpower, a steal at 755 points, might as well have been a trillion bucks for me. I barely had a fraction of that and no prospects of earning the rest anytime soon. Opting for a power over an item made sense. Powers were harder to snatch away than items, which could easily be swiped by a nimble-fingered pickpocket or forcibly taken by someone stronger. Unfortunately, my meager points disagreed with my preference. Downgrading was inevitable. So, I navigated toward the less glamorous section items related to mental powers. And boy, did I enter a strange and wondrous realm. Among the assortment were a dagger that promised to induce berserker mode with a mere cut, a feather touted to summon tears when tickled against skin, and a host of other bizarre gadgets with varying and equally quirky uses. It was like stumbling into a yard sale hosted by Shiagaroth himself, the Didric Prince of Madness. The items in this mental bazaar were more absurd than a talking cheese wheel. But this wasn't about browsing for quirky collectibles or oddities to display on a shelf. No, this was about safeguarding my brain from prying minds. Amidst the craziness, I finally spotted something promising an amulet of mental warding. It whispered promises of shielding my mind from even the most persistent telepaths. I stared at it, then at my pitiful points still stuck at a disappointing, suspicious 195. If this thing cost 200 points like I initially expected, I swore someone was going to pay. I didn't know who or when, but somebody was definitely going to suffer my wrath. With a mix of apprehension and determination, I clicked on the amulet to check its price. The number started with a tantalizing one, teasingly close to what I could afford. But then, the digits unfurled like a cruel joke 196 points. Godem it all. I erupted into an expletive-laden bout of frustration, words tumbling out in a mess of gibberish that even I couldn't decipher. In my rage, I found myself trying to strangle the air, wishing someone's neck was within my grip instead. For a solid minute, I spat out incomprehensible words and wrestled with the air before finally reigning in my temper. There I was, grumbling and accepting the cruel twist of fate that left me at the mercy of a single point, downgrading me yet again to the pitiful section of one-time use items. I found myself swimming in options again, facing a mishmash of choices that would give a hyperactive squirrel a run for its nuts. But details? Spare you the agony, I shall. After a dizzying search, I finally settled on a consumable called the Mental Shield Talisman. At a paltry two points, it was a steal no flashy effects, no drama, just instant activation upon purchase. The catch? It had an expiration date, lasting a mere 24 hours. But when you're scraping the bottom of the points barrel, beggars can't be choosers, can they? I crunched the numbers in my head, calculating that with my available points, it'd get me through approximately three months. By then, I hoped to have hoarded enough points to buy something more permanent. Sure. It was a short-term fix, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Remember when I swore off using the system? Well, that was before I uncovered a sneaky loophole. Turns out, raking in points didn't require me to wreak havoc or unleash chaos. Nope, just being a player in the big events was enough to earn rewards, whether my impact was angelic or downright devilish. What's more, though it might be wishful thinking, I had a hunch that rubbing elbows with heroes and villains, yanking their strings here and there, and molding their fates could fill my point piggy bank too. Establishing relationships, whether cozy or combative and nudging their moral compasses might just unlock a reward chest of points. It was all about making a mark in the grand scheme of things. This system felt like one of those user manual not included gadgets, leaving me to navigate its labyrinth of features blindfolded. But hey, asking for help? That'd be like shouting into a void. So, embracing the sink or swim philosophy, I dove into the unknown. Life's all about the thrill of the unknown, right? Or so my spontaneous wisdom would dictate. Feeling a tad philosophical or perhaps just delusional I conjured up an image of an older, sagely looking version of myself stroking his long, flowing white beard with his hand. It seemed fitting for a moment as I went ahead and clicked to purchase the mental shield talisman. The sales pitch promised instant activation sense any flashy theatrics. So subtle, in fact, I almost wondered if it had actually done anything. But before I could dive into that mystery, a notification popped up, stealing my attention. By purchasing an item for the first time, excluding the tutorial items, you have unlocked the Daily Deals tab in the shop. Cue the drumroll of curiosity. 
it felt like stumbling upon a hidden section in a game, you know, the one where they lure you with flashy deals you don't really need but want anyway? Yeah, I might have been guilty of a few too many hours on mobile games in my previous life, mostly during extended breaks at work on the company's time, of course. A fool shits on his break, while a wise man shits on the company's clock, or so the wiser side of me dictated, yet again. I leaned in, eager to see what this daily deals section had in store. Who knew? Maybe it'd be like Black Friday, but for cosmic doodads. Just as I was ready to peel back the cosmic curtain and peek into the daily deals, Livewire's electrifying voice jolted through the door. What's taking so long, pal? The brawl's done, and the metalheads are waiting in the stadium. She sounded peeved, instantly grounding my excitement like a lightning rod in a thunderstorm. Yet, yeah, yet. Yeah. I'm coming. I called back, quickly closing the system interface and rising from my seat. Guess the new shop section will have to wait, I grumbled to myself as I made my way toward the exit. But as I took a few steps, a commotion behind me made me halt. Angry chattering. I swiveled around to find Radigan, looking at me with a downright affronted expression. And here I was hoping to make a swift exit and forget all about you, I muttered under my breath, but it seemed the rat caught every word. It responded with a barrage of indignant chitters, clearly taking offense. All right, all right, come on, let's go, I sighed, rolling my eyes in surrender as I extended my hand toward the critter. Without hesitation, Radigan scurried over and perched itself smugly on my shoulder, looking like it just claimed the Iron Throne of Rodents. Chapter 11, Naive Optimism In the heart of the stadium, I stood, eyebrow raised, eyeing the eclectic assembly of robots. I use the term army loosely, it was more of a robotic menagerie than a disciplined force. Humanoid bots rubbed shoulders with insectoid counterparts, while animalistic constructs mingled with those resembling creatures from myth and odd abstract shapes straight out of an advanced math book utter chaos. If Zafety hadn't spilled the beans about the system's hand in this metropolis invasion, the rampant disarray of these metallic intruders would have been clue enough. Chaos seemed to be the system's calling card, after all. Before I could delve into the existential ramifications of it all, Livewire's voice cut through the metallic cacophony. Look sharp, genius. The super jerk is here, she declared, and I instinctively turned my gaze skyward. There he was, the man of steel himself, cape billowing as he descended with the grace that never failed to impress. You'd think I'd be more blasé about it after everything that had transpired, but come on it's Superman. There's a reason his slow descent never gets old. It's like a scene lifted straight from the pages of a DC comic. Superman wasted no time, his gaze fixed on Livewire as he expressed gratitude. Thank you for your assistance, Miss Willis. Your intervention prevented many casualties, he acknowledged trailing off at the end of his sentence. But I have to ask, what prompted this sudden change of heart? Superman's inquiry maintained a sense of genuine curiosity rather than suspicion or judgment. Classic Boy Scout. Livewire responded with a sneer. It's Livewire now, pal. Better get that through your thick skull. She corrected, quickly regaining her usual smirk. I was all set to find and zap you to death once I broke free. Her eyes locked onto Superman's electric arcs dancing around her body. The girl had balls of steel, and she wasn't holding back. My new friend here convinced me otherwise, she added, throwing a nod in my direction. Leave the talking to me. Well done. Superman shifted his attention to me, his eyes conducting a thorough inspection. You're the young man who was lying on the street during the battle, he observed, a blend of amusement and confusion on his features. I can't quite put my finger on it, but you seem slightly different. His narrowed eyes hinted at a suspicion. If I had to wager a guess, the change he detected likely originated from my enhanced persuasion ability, subtly altering my posture and demeanor. Couldn't let him catch on to that secret. It's probably the shoes, I deflected, gesturing casually toward my new pair of kicks. That prompted a smile from the man of steel. Name's Micah Foster, you could say I'm Livewire's manager, I introduced myself. Superman nodded at me. Then I must thank you as well for helping Miss Leslie see reason, he said, sounding genuinely grateful. However, despite my personal reservations, she remains a convicted criminal and must be returned to jail, he added, turning back to Livewire with a regretful look. Livewire's expression instantly twisted into a rage at those words. The hell I am! She exclaimed, arcs of electricity dancing along her body. If you want to take me back to the big house, 
you better be ready to drag me there kicking and screaming, super jerk. She added, lowering her posture and widening her arms, clearly ready for a fight. Before Superman could reply, I stepped forward and placed my arm on Livewire's shoulder, a smile on my face. Of course, she'll even willingly turn herself into the authorities, I said, and the electricity immediately vanished from Livewire's body, and she turned to me with a bewildered look. I am. She said, staring at me dumbly. Absolutely. How else could we consider negotiating a lighter sentence or a pardon for you if you are on the run? I said with a sigh. Not to worry, though. You won't spend more than a month in the big house, especially since Superman here is going to vouch for you, I added, and it was now Superman's turn to look confused. I didn't give Superman a chance to express his confusion, instead, I seized the moment. I know I'm throwing a curveball here, but Livewire is genuinely aiming for a fresh start, maybe even considering a new talk show or something, I calmly proposed, giving Livewire's shoulder a reassuring squeeze. She nodded, seemingly deep in thought. Superman managed a bittersweet smile. Do you understand the weight of what you're asking? He inquired, casting me a reproachful look. I do. If you vouch for her, and she goes back to her old ways, well, you take the fall, and your reputation might take a hit, I responded with a determined nod. On the flip side, if Livewire seizes this second chance to pursue an honest life. I let my sentence trail off intentionally. Just think about the countless individuals like her who become criminals simply because they think they can't be anything else, a single redemption just might be the nudge they need to see things from another perspective. Admittedly, I felt a bit uneasy laying out these terms. Superman had been my hero since childhood, and now, I found myself placing him in a tough spot choosing between potentially tarnishing his own integrity and redeeming a notorious criminal. But in reality, there wasn't much of a choice. Superman had only one way to respond. True to form, his smile transformed into genuine agreement. So be it, he said with a nod. Will you turn yourself in, or would you prefer I accompany you, Miss Leslie? Superman directed his gaze toward Livewire. That's Superman for you. I wouldn't have dared to make such a request with anyone else, but Superman embodied naive optimism, always seeking the good even in the most villainous individuals, except when it came to Darkseid and Brainiac, but that's completely different. My choice of words might seem like an insult or an attempt at mockery, but I meant naive optimism in the best possible way. The Man of Steel is called the symbol of hope for a reason, you know? I turned to glance at Livewire, and her expression was nothing short of priceless. The way she regarded Superman as if he were some kind of fool almost tempted a chuckle from me, but I managed to suppress it. The entire charade had been in motion since the beginning Livewire's feigned outrage, her surprise at my assertion that she'd willingly surrender, all of it planned to showcase my ability to influence her and increase the weight of my word with Superman. However, I could tell she was experiencing real shock right about now, and it wasn't surprising. She probably wouldn't trust herself as much as Superman was trusting her right now. I couldn't blame her since soups had that effect on people. But she seemed to be taking an unusually long time to process the situation, prompting me to clear my throat and snap her out of her daze. I've got a pair of perfectly working feet. Livewire retorted with a scoff. I'll shimmy back into my cozy cell, but don't get it twisted I ain't caving because I'm scared of you, jerk man, she added, transforming into an arc of electricity and entering the nearest electricity pole, much to both my and Superman's amusement. As she disappeared, a notification popped up in my vision. Livewire's alignment has changed from, villainous, to, sly. Another prompt swiftly followed. You have been rewarded 150 points. Jackpot, looks like I was right. I mused, standing there, thoughts of exploring the systems shop already dancing in my head. Still, Superman's presence snapped me back to reality. Thanks for your help. And I'm really sorry for putting you in such a tough spot. I said, mixing genuine gratitude with a touch of apology. No need to worry, young man, Superman replied, his smile practically carrying its own superhero theme tune. I do what I do not for applause or adoration, but because it's the right thing. He said, and I could basically hear the heroic music playing in the background as he spoke. Classic Superman, I thought, silently fanboying. Now then. I'm sure you have many things to do, and so do I, so I won't hold you here, Superman said, releasing me from my superhero chat. I nodded in agreement, eager to get out of here before I started fanboying for real or spilling my secrets. 
I turned away with a satisfied smile, ready to explore the possibilities in the systems shop. But just as I thought I was in the clear, another voice rang out in the stadium, putting my triumphant exit on pause. Please wait a minute, young man. Chapter 12, Karma I let out a quiet sigh as the green lantern floated my way. Well, a green lantern, anyway. Let's see what we have here. I mused, giving him an inspecting look. He wasn't black, so he's definitely not John Stewart. He didn't look like a high school delinquent, so he wasn't Guy Gardner, either. Too young to be Kyle Rayner, so that only leaves one person. It's got to be Hal Jordan. Uptight and a tad reckless perfect combo for a pleasant chat. I kept my thoughts to myself and threw on a smile. What can I do for you? I asked, trying to keep it cool. Would you mind if I scanned you with my ring, young man? Hal calmly dropped his request, and instantly, I felt the urge to let out a string of curses. But before I could unleash my linguistic creativity, Superman decided to intervene. What's going on, Hal? Superman queried, flicking his gaze between me and Green Lantern. Call it a hunch, if you will. Hal replied, shooting me a suspicious look. But I think there's more than meets the eye to your friend here. He raised an eyebrow for added drama. Superman, not thrilled with this, furrowed his brows. A hunch isn't grounds to invade someone's privacy, Superman said with a frown. Besides, Micah here helped us prevent many casualties, so we should give him the benefit of the doubt, he added, sounding pretty firm about it. Hal Jordan let out a sigh, his arms crossed in a display of reluctance. True, not a fan of this, but it's Green Corps protocol, he stated firmly. All off-worlders must be identified and reported to the Guardians. And you have to admit, sleeping in the middle of a war zone? That's a bit suspicious, he added, raising an eyebrow. Superman shook his head, emphasizing their commitment to the law. That may be, but we, as Justice League members, can only operate within the confines of the law. You can't enforce the Guardian's rules on civilians based on a hunch, he pointed out. I'm fully aware of it. That's why I asked for permission. Hal Jordan replied with a nonchalant shrug. It's up to him whether to accept it or not, he added, and both heroes turned their gaze toward me. Talk about instant karma. I weighed my options. Refusing might cast me in a suspicious light, and even though the Justice League heroes wouldn't openly defy the law, they could keep tabs on me, making my life so much more complicated than it needs to be. On the flip side, letting Hal Jordan probe into my business might unearth more than I wanted to reveal. Decisions, decisions. I just rolled my eyes and threw my hands up in a mock surrender. Go ahead, scan away, I said, giving in to the inevitable. Hal Jordan didn't waste any time, pointing his power ring at me like some intergalactic detective. The ring lit up with this intense green glow, surrounding me like a sci-fi x-ray. A moment later, the light disappeared, leaving Hal deep in thought, and Superman looking on like the concerned dad. So, what's the scoop, Hal? Superman asked. Hal scratched his head, looking all serious. His energy signature is a bit of a head-scratcher. Doesn't match the invaders, but it doesn't match ours either, he explained, his eyebrows doing the conundrum dance. I jumped in before they could start a superhero debate club. Hold up, what are you guys talking about? I interjected, doing my best to sell the confused bystander look. I was just having the sweetest dream on my couch, and bam, I woke up in the middle of the street. No alien invasion on my itinerary. Superman nodded in agreement. He did seem genuinely clueless when he woke up, but he still recognized me, he said, with that look parents give each other when the kid says something bizarre on his face. Could your ring have malfunctioned? He suggested. Hal shook his head. No, the ring doesn't malfunction. Sometimes worlds are eerily alike as in copy-paste versions with a few differences. Maybe you were transported here from a parallel universe. He concluded, looking like he just solved an interdimensional Sudoku puzzle. So, what's the deal for me in all this? I questioned, arms crossed, staring at Hal Jordan. Nothing to worry about, he reassured me with a casual wave. Green Lantern protocol for off-worlders is straightforward. If you're hostile, we apprehend and confine. If not, we either send you back to your original world when possible or assist in integrating you into ours, he explained. I took a moment to process that, then gave a nod. Sounds peachy, but there's always a catch, right? I arched an eyebrow, 
skeptical. No catch. Just a few questions to get to know your background and check if returning you to your world is feasible, Hal responded, shrugging like he was discussing his weekend plans. Well, I don't mind answering a few questions if it helps, I replied, deciding to play along for now. What do you need to know? Not so fast. I'll need you to accompany me to the Justice League headquarters first, Hal replied and I immediately gave him the classic are you serious? Frown. He caught on to my reaction and felt the need to clarify his grand plan. I'll need to record any info you can provide about your world and cross-check it with ours using the Legal ES data. We'll have someone else do the research in real time to make the process efficient, he explained with a surprising calmness. Hey, nice try, Hal. I might have bought his story, if I didn't know that Martian Manhunter basically lived in the Watchtower, keeping telepathic communication between all members of the League and the countless advanced gadgets that would make communication extremely easy. I suspected he was leading me to Martian Manhunter for a mind-reading session or letting Batman eavesdrop, but jokes on him. My mind was protected by a consumable talisman, and I could easily snag something from the system that would make me a better liar than Walter fucking White. Sure thing. So. Are we going by car or something? I played the clueless card. Hal responded with a chuckle, not quite, he said, seemingly scheming something probably planning to lift me off the ground without a heads up. The guy must think he's hilarious. It seems like you two have settled things, Superman, previously on the sidelines, remarked in a composed manner. I would have liked to tag along, but I have a few errands to tend to. He added, retrieving a sophisticated looking device from his belt. Some Kryptonian doohickey, no doubt. He pressed a button on said Kryptonian doohickey, and in an instant, several humanoid machines with sleek designs and Superman's emblem on their chests materialized. With swift efficiency, the Man of Steel directed them to relocate the robots. As his Kryptonian minions carried out the task, Superman turned to us. I'll be on my way, then, he declared, soaring into the sky without waiting for a reply. Are you prepared to leave? He inquired. Just need to grab something real quick, I responded, injecting a hint of mystery into my tone. Hal appeared puzzled, but he accepted it with a shrug. I gave him a nod and, for added flair, placed two fingers in my mouth. I took a deep breath and let out this ear-piercing whistle that bounced around the stadium. Right on cue, Radigan waltzed in, strutting down the player's walkway like he was the MVP returning after an injury break. The moment his tiny paws hit the grass, he stopped and shot me a blank look. In my mind, I immediately translated it as, Do I look like a pet dog to you, you silly human? My expression promptly dropped. I'm leaving you behind if you don't start moving right this instant. I exclaimed, and the usual affronted look immediately appeared on Radigan's face, as if he couldn't believe what he heard. I mean it, you cheeky little rodent. Hurry up and get your tiny ass over here. I said unmindful of the strange look Hal Jordan was giving me. Finally conceding defeat. Radigan emitted an irritated chitter and strolled in my direction. He was clearly deliberately taking his sweet time, likely just to piss me off. I rolled my eyes, standing there, unfazed, as I awaited the arrival of this mischievous rodent. When Radigan finally stopped before me, I reached out my hand toward him. Naturally, he didn't forget to sink his teeth into my finger, and I could only wince, my eyes twitching as I watched Radigan nonchalantly settle on my shoulder. Hal Jordan raised an eyebrow looking all shocked and confused. This is... He asked. I just shrugged it off. Just some stupid, oversized RA ouch. I said, but before I could continue, Radigan bit my ear, causing me to yelp mid-sentence. The little bastard just appeared out of nowhere and decided I'm his long-lost parent or something, I explained, trying to poke the little critter away from my ear, only to get my finger bitten again instead. Chapter 13, Questions and Answers as we shot into the air, I couldn't help but gawk at my own body, wrapped in this shimmering green energy like a cosmic burrito. It was like being embraced by a weightless, see-through, glow-in-the-dark blanket. Now, Green Lantern powers might not make you bench-press buildings like Superman, but it's undeniably one of the coolest and most versatile superpowers in all of fiction. You could say it's the Swiss Army knife of the superhero world. The possibilities are only limited by your imagination and, of course, your willpower. In the right hands, that glowing ring would undoubtedly live up to its reputation as the most powerful weapon in the universe as those Green Lantern Corps folks like to boast. Glancing up at Hal Jordan, I found him staring back at me with an almost disappointed expression. 
I expected more of a reaction, he remarked. I couldn't help but chuckle at his comment. Well, you weren't exactly pulling off a subtle surprise party. I said with a shrug. I saw you scheming to pull the rug out from under my feet a mile away. I replied with a nonchalant shrug, pausing as everything around me started turning dark. I was in friggin' space. Can we stop here for a moment? I requested, and Hal Jordan shot me a confused look before realization seemed to dawn on him. He slowed down, and I couldn't help but marvel at the breathtaking view of the universe around us the ultimate pit stop, if you will. First time, space rookie. Hal Jordan quipped with a mischievous grin. I shot him an incredulous look. What do you think? I retorted, the sass in my tone enough to make even Radigan proud. Hal chuckled, his eyes glancing toward the cheeky rat perched on my shoulder. Your pet rat seems like a seasoned space traveler, though. He gestured to Radigan, who responded with a series of angry chitters, evidently offended by Hal's assessment. Setting aside Radigan's protest, Hal's observation was spot on. The audacious critter sat on my shoulder as if space travel was a routine affair, gazing down at Earth with an air of superiority. It made sense, considering the interdimensional nature of the cheeky rat, concealed beneath its deceptive appearance. Well, Radigan does have an inflated opinion of himself, that's just his way, I replied with a nonchalant shrug. Now, can I get a minute to soak in the cosmic view, or are you on a tight schedule? I added, shooting Hal Jordan a playful side glance. You've got five. Despite appearances, I'm a busy space guy, Hal Jordan quipped back, and I simply nodded, ready to enjoy my brief moment among the stars. Or at least, that's how I made it look. As much as I wanted to savor the cosmic scenery, duty called. Without skipping a beat, I summoned the system's interface, navigating my way to the shop section. Eyes dancing over the holographic controls, I fine-tuned the filters until, voila, I found exactly what I needed the improved acting skill. Just what the doctor ordered, I mused, silently perusing the skill's description. Improved acting skill, master the art of deception with this upgraded acting prowess. Become a virtuoso in the theater of life, capable of delivering performances so convincing that even the most discerning eyes won't detect a hint of falsehood. Whether you're spinning tall tales or navigating complex social situations, this skill turns you into the ultimate thespian, leaving no room for immediate doubt or suspicion. Leaving no room for immediate doubt or suspicion. I mused, a smile playing on my lips. The system's choice of words made a lot of sense. No matter how convincing or flawless a lie, in the end, is just that a lie. You simply had to dig deep enough to uncover it. Since the Justice League would have to find my original world to unearth it, I was more than comfortable buying the skill, and so I did. It came at the price of 210 points, which seemed pretty fair, all things considered. Anyway, seeing as I had some time, I decided to navigate to the Daily Deals section. Much to my disappointment, I only found one option, an elixir of ludicrous laughter, promising uncontrollable and riotous laughter for the user, which was downright useless in any serious situation. And what do you know? It was on a huge, 99% discount, bringing its price from 100 points all the way to just one point. Yup, the system's sense of humor seemed intact. Welp, it's back to staring into space for me, I guess. As Martian Manhunter peered through the one-way mirror into the interrogation room reserved for criminals, a soft sigh escaped him. Inside, a young man, easily lost in a crowd, sat across from Hal Jordan. The young man, one Micah Foster, with his short black hair, unassuming features and casual attire, looked far from extraordinary. There was a subtle peculiarity in the way he moved and carried himself that caught Martian Manhunter's attention. His rat companion, which was held in another room, seemed a bit too intelligent and strange in many ways, but that was all. The young man didn't fit the typical profile of someone slated for interrogation or mind probing, but Martian Manhunter understood the necessity of scrutinizing individuals from other worlds. His experience and mastery of telepathic abilities allowed him to discern truth from lies without needing to delve into the opponent's mind, so he had no reason to refuse Hal Jordan's request despite his reservations. Before Martian Manhunter could delve too deep into his own thoughts, Hal Jordan initiated the questioning. For the record, please state your full name and age, Hal requested with a focused gaze. Micah, seemingly composed, nodded in response. Micah Foster, 27 years old, he replied, his voice steady. Martian Manhunter keenly observed Micah for any subtle tells but found none, prompting him to turn to the console, searching for anyone that might match Micah's profile. 
truthful, but I found no record of him in our database, Martian Manhunter telepathically conveyed, projecting his thoughts directly into Hal Jordan's mind. Hal acknowledged Micah with a nod, a furrow of concentration on his brow, before proceeding with the interrogation. Do you have any close friends or family? He inquired, adding a touch of empathy to the questioning. Micah's expression shifted, a brief flicker of discomfort crossing his features at the mention of personal connections. No, Micah responded a bit too quickly, his gaze momentarily distant. I grew up in the foster care system, and I was too busy studying and then working to maintain any friendships, he calmly explained. Hal Jordan registered a momentary surprise, his eyes narrowing slightly, as Martian Manhunter once again confirmed Micah's honesty. With a subtle nod, Hal continued, probing deeper into Micah's unique circumstances. Hal delved into a multitude of questions about Micah's background. The young man didn't flinch at the inquiries, offering detailed information about the various foster families, schools and colleges he attended, concluding with insights into the company where he interned and later worked. Martian Manhunter, stationed in his spot, scrutinized Micah closely, searching for any subtle hints of falsehoods. Throughout this process, he cross-referenced the provided information, identifying similarities and disparities between Micah's world and their own. As the green-skinned Martian unearthed these findings, including shared people and places as well as those exclusive to Micah's reality, he conveyed his discoveries to Hal Jordan. Hal, in his characteristic calm demeanor, simply nodded at the insights. That would be all I need to know about your background, he stated evenly. Hal then transitioned seamlessly to the next line of inquiry, his tone neutral. Would you mind if I asked you some questions about your world? He proposed, to which Micah responded with a nonchalant shrug, signaling his readiness to field whatever questions came his way. You seem to have recognized Superman, the beacon of hope, despite just stepping into our world, Hal remarked, his tone acquiring a touch of gravity. Does that mean Superman and the legendary Justice League exist in your world? He inquired, his keen gaze fixed on Micah. Micah, maintaining an air of nonchalance, responded with a smile, almost everyone knows Superman and the Justice League where I come from. How else would I recognize him? His words carried a subtle undertone of familiarity. In that case, are you well acquainted with the perils and challenges the Justice League faced in your world? Hal Jordan pressed on, his eyes revealing the weight of the question. Take a moment to think before answering, your insights might be crucial in saving lives and preventing potential disasters, he urged, emphasizing the profound impact of Micah's responses. Sorry to disappoint, but how would I have insight into that? Micah replied, a hint of incredulity in his tone. He shot a slightly judgmental look at Hal. Wait, you don't go around disclosing the League's confidential matters in this world, do you? He asked, raising an eyebrow. Hal chuckled wryly and shook his head. Of course, we don't. It's just that the allure of preventing future tragedies was too compelling for me not to inquire, he admitted with a sigh receiving Martian Manhunter's telepathic confirmation that Micah's responses were genuine. In any case, we're almost done here. Hal said, regaining his serious demeanor. I'll only need to ask you a few more questions and run a few simple, non-invasive tests and you'll be free to go. Chapter 14, Radigan's Retaliation Looking at the peculiar sight of the regal rat through the one-way glass, Martian Manhunter couldn't help but win CE, holding his forehead in pain. The rat, adorned with a tiny crown, seemed to exude an air of regality that clashed comically with its rodent nature. Adding to the bewilderment, the rat locked eyes with the Martian Manhunter, its gaze carrying surprisingly intense scrutiny. Seeing it was just a small animal, he had no qualms about probing its psyche, and so Martian Manhunter decided to delve into its mind to discern its origin. However, to his surprise and discomfort, the rat not only detected his intrusion but also retaliated with surprising viciousness. A sudden, Intense headache overcame Martian Manhunter, causing him to writhe in pain. It was an experience unlike any he had encountered before. Unable to endure the pain, Martian Manhunter quickly reached out to Hal Jordan for assistance. The door to the room swung open, and Hal burst in, a mix of concern and alarm on his face as he observed the distressed state of Martian Manhunter. What happened? Are you all right, John? Hal exclaimed, rushing to the Martian Manhunter's side. That? that creature is a telepath of considerable might. Martian Manhunter replied through gritted teeth. I... I need you to get me out of here. He struggled to articulate his words, clearly in immense pain. Hal Jordan's eyes widened, and his immediate instinct was to launch an attack on the rat. 
he raised his ring hand, pointing it menacingly at the creature through the one-way glass. However, the Martian Manhunter quickly intervened, grabbing Hal's wrist. No the creature was merely defending itself, from my intrusion. He urgently conveyed. It's, not, innately hostile. His words grew fainter with each utterance. Hal Jordan hesitated for a second before swiftly carrying Martian Manhunter and getting him out of the room. As they left, Radigan wore a smug expression, sensing their departure. Once alone, he closed his eyes and crossed his arms, exuding an air of accomplishment. Lounging in the waiting room, casually sipping the tea that Hal Jordan so graciously provided, I was bombarded with a series of notifications that seemed more unpredictable than a soap opera plot. Your relationship with the Martian Manhunter has shifted from, neutral, to, curious. You've just been handed 50 points. Lucky you. Your relationship with Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, has also decided to spice things up, shifting from, neutral, to, curious. Another 50 points casually tossed your way. Hold on, your relationship with the Martian Manhunter couldn't decide if it's, curious, or, cautious. Oh, snap. Now you've struck gold with 100 points. In the grand finale, your relationship with Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, has taken a wild turn to, hostile. Jackpot. 200 points are yours for the taking. Surprise, surprise. Your relationship with Green Lantern is back to, cautious. Well, the notifications were more robotic and uniform, but they might as well have been like this. I scratched my head, attempting to decipher this roller coaster of virtual emotions. I was grateful for the points, but what the heck could have occurred to trigger such a tumultuous shift in their perceptions when they were miles away from my charming presence? Suddenly, a mental image of that smug oversized rodent flashed in my mind, and it all clicked. That damned rat, what the hell did he do? I mumbled eyeing the tea suspiciously as if it held the answers to the enigma of my ever-changing relationships. Before I could embark on my tea interrogation mission, the door swung open, and in walked Hal Jordan, cool and collected as if nothing had happened. We're finally done, and you're free to go. He announced, handing me a smartphone and a wallet as if they were party favors. I squinted at the items in my hand. What's this? I inquired, giving him a dubious look. We've contacted the local authorities and created a new identity for you so you can integrate into our society. Hal Jordan explained, his words unveiling a whole new level of superhero hospitality. The phone has contact info for a government agent who will assist you within reason. His gaze then shifted to the wallet. Inside, you'll find some change, the address of the apartment we've assigned you, insurance, and details for a bank account in your name with a bit of extra cash. He concluded. I nodded appreciatively tucking the items into my pocket. So, there's no way to send me back, I take it. I questioned with a furrowed brow. We don't know that yet, but until we figure it out, we can't have you staying homeless, Hal Jordan clarified. Moreover, we've arranged for you to take some exams to match your degree here, but that'll take some time. He added. I couldn't help but pause, eyes widening at the surprisingly considerate and generous gesture. That's surprisingly considerate and very generous. I remarked, nodding in genuine appreciation. I had expected to be thrown into some makeshift homeless shelter and left to my own devices while they sorted out the details that's the kind of treatment I'd expect from the authorities in my previous world. I guess I shouldn't have expected any less from an organization of superheroes. Hal Jordan nodded, a sense of finality in his demeanor. That's all. Come with me to pick up your pet rat so I can take you back to Earth. I noticed a subtle eagerness in his voice almost as if he couldn't wait for my cheeky rodent companion to vacate the premises. The suspicion that Radigan, the oversized rat, played a role in the emotional roller coaster Hal and Manhunter experienced regarding me grew stronger. Are you sure about Radigan, though? I asked, feigning concern. I mean, he might be from another world too, right? What if he's dangerous? Hal's annoyance was thinly veiled as he replied, Well, that's exactly why you should keep Radigan with you. He seems attached to you somehow, and if he's indeed dangerous, then keeping him contained might backfire. Right, right. Safety first, I suppose, I said with a casual shrug, hiding a smirk. Let's go get Rat Iran then then. We made our way to the room where Radigan awaited. Hal hesitated at the entrance, eyeing the regal rat warily. You're sure he won't, I don't know, attack me or something. He said, 
and his expression suggested he was recalling something unpleasant. I wonder what Radigan did exactly to earn such caution. I couldn't help but chuckle at the thought. Oh, might, but it's just Radigan's way of saying hello. Don't worry, you're in the presence of rodent royalty. Hal gave me a dubious look but cautiously entered the room. I followed, watching as Radigan perched regally on a miniature throne fashioned from various knick-knacks he found in the room. Come on, your highness, time to hit the road, I called, and the rat, almost theatrically, descended from his throne and scurried over. As I reached down to scoop him up, I couldn't resist a parting shot at Hal. Who knows, maybe Radigan can join the Justice League one day, don't you think? I said, earning an instant glare from Hal. He's very smart, you know? And he's probably from another world. Maybe he has superpowers, too. Hal cleared his throat. Maybe. He dryly said. In any case, let's get moving. Ah. New York City. I muttered as I took a deep breath, catching a whiff of that classic city air. It had a mix of car fumes, street food sizzling somewhere nearby, and a touch of that gritty sidewalk vibe. Not far away from me, I could see a seagull, catching a rat's tail and struggling to fly away with it. Meanwhile, a vertically challenged individual let's go with that, as it's probably the PC term these days, was sitting on the sidewalk shirtless, sporting a dinosaur mask while expertly drumming away with a pair of extremely short arms. People dressed in all manner of clothes casual, business, formal, and even some weirdo in a speedo walked around like all of this was nothing out of the ordinary. Heck, no one even took a second glance at the rat cosplaying a king on my shoulder either. The New York City of my world was also chaotic, but I suppose the comic book factor had a hand in boosting the coziness factor of this city. Still, this suited me just fine since I could fly under the radar more easily amidst all the craziness. Looks like we'll be staying here for a while. I said as I turned to Radigan, and he replied with a chitter of regal indifference. I know, right? Anyway, let's go and find our apartment then. I could use some sleep. Chapter 15, Vigilant Law Offices Otter's Note Hey amazing readers! I hope you're all enjoying the journey through the twists and turns of our story. I wanted to take a quick moment to chat about something stats necessary from any story on this site, Power Stones. You might be wondering, what are Power Stones and what the hell do you want them? Well, my friends, they're like magical tokens that can help our story shine even brighter. Here's the scoop, when you drop a Power Stone on our story, it's not just a vote it's like a rocket boost. Why does this matter? Well, it's all about the weekly ranking. The more Power Stones we gather, the higher we climb in the ranks. And guess what? A higher spot means more exposure for our story. So, here's my humble request, if you're enjoying the ride and want to see more, consider dropping a Power Stone our way. Your support ensures that more readers discover our tale, and it paves the way for even more adventures. Think of it as your secret superpower to help our story reach new heights. Thank you a million times for being the awesome readers you are. Your support means the world to me, and together, we're making this journey truly special. Happy reading and power stone sprinkling. Feeling a furry weight settle on my chest, I groaned, just, you know, maybe five more minutes. I clung to the last shreds of sleep reluctant to face the world beyond the warm cocoon of my bed. However, my peaceful snooze was abruptly interrupted by the sensation of two tiny paws playing dentist in my mouth. Ouch. Seriously, you oversized furball. I yelped, abruptly sitting up and tossing Radigan away. To my chagrin, he executed a mid-air acrobatics routine, kicking off the wall like he was auditioning for a rodent Cirque du Soleil. I shot him an exasperated look not in the mood for a showdown with a rat before my morning coffee. With a weary sigh, I silenced the blaring alarm on my phone, banishing the remnants of my dream world. Despite dedicating most of my life to the corporate grind, the ungodly hour of waking up was an eternal nemesis of mine. You'd think I'd be one of those chipper morning people, but nope, I was more of a give-me-caffeine-before-conversation kind of guy despite being the first to arrive at work and the last to leave. Swinging my legs over the edge of the bed, I retrieved my phone, and Radigan, apparently unfazed by his recent aerial adventure, hopped back onto my shoulder. He perched there regally as if supervising the morning routine was his sovereign duty. As I prepared for a busy day, Radigan seemed to revel in his role as the royal wake-up wizard. If only his majesty could find a more civilized method of rousing me from slumber. Allowing the cheeky rat to have its morning victory, I succumbed to its territorial claims on the bed. 
the shower, a cascading waterfall of wakefulness, rejuvenated me. A quick change into a freshly purchased set of clothes from yesterday completed my transformation from a sleep-deprived ghoul into a more acceptable member of society as I headed out of the apartment, bestowed upon me by the government. Or maybe it was the Justice League. Eh, who cares? The apartment, though far from luxurious, felt like a princely abode in the grand saga of New York living a place where a 4x4 rat hole was considered the norm. The rent in New York was a tale of woe best saved for another day, after all. Venturing into the bustling chaos of city life, I retrieved my phone, a device that held the secrets to my meticulously planned schedule, conceived during a bout of insomnia the night before. I need to rent a car to get around, but first things first. I muttered, casting a quick eye over my list of chores, sealing it away like a hidden treasure map. I need my morning coffee, and I need it yesterday. Determined and caffeine deprived, I set my course for what appeared to be a coffee haven across the street, Radigan still perched atop my shoulder like some arrogant little gargoyle. Taking leisurely sips from my iced coffee, I strolled towards the car rental agency when an unexpected sight on the roadside caught my attention. A sign boldly proclaimed Jim above the entrance of what seemed to be a training facility. There was an oddly familiar aura about the place, but my attempts to pinpoint its origin ended in a mental shrug. Curiosity prevailed, I approached the establishment and peered through the window. They're really going at it. I mumbled to myself, observing a multitude of individuals engrossed in various forms of exercise weightlifting, cardio and even a few engaged in lively sparring within a boxing ring or assaulting a defenseless punching bag. While it appeared to be a commendable boxing gym, my knowledge of such matters was rather limited. My combat resume peaked at thwarting wannabe bullies in my childhood by wielding a baseball bat to instill some much-needed reflection. It did lead to my foster family at the time giving me the boot, and I danced precariously close to juvenile detention, but it was definitely worth it. On second thoughts, definitely is a strong word. It was probably worth it. I think. Well, I do need to expand my combat education. Maybe I'll swing by and have another look later. I muttered to myself, and Radigan's chittering instantly brought me out of my contemplation. All right, all right. I'm going, aren't I? I said with a scoff as I left the boxing gym behind me, heading straight toward my original destination, the car rental agency. Ever found yourself in a situation where you could almost taste the change in the atmosphere? That's precisely what hit me as I cruised past the Welcome to Gotham sign at the city's edge. Despite the sun still gracing the sky, a peculiar darkness seemed to settle in the air the moment I left that sign behind. Now, New York wasn't exactly a pristine haven brimming with rainbows and sunshine, what with its stale city air and public shady dealings lurking on every street corner crimes even my untrained eyes could spot from a mile away. Yet, rolling into Gotham, or rather driving straight into the heart of old Gotham's financial district, felt like transitioning into an entirely different realm. Sure. I knew I was heading for a less savory part of town, but I hadn't anticipated Gotham to be so very, well, Gotham-ish. The transformation was palpable. Navigating through the city's towering buildings with their ominous gothic decor, I found myself surrounded by neon signs casting an otherworldly glow. Pedestrians, bundled up in unnecessarily heavy attire, trudged through the streets, each wearing a scowl that could put your average New Yorker to shame. Even Radigan, the ever-arrogant menace to society, that he was, seemed on edge as he surveyed the surroundings with his beady little eyes, reflecting the neon lights. Now, you might be wondering what the hell I was doing in this less than inviting place. It certainly wasn't for the scenic views, I'll tell you that much. I could go into the mundane details, but since I'm closing in on my destination, I might as well let actions speak louder than words. After parking the car, I stepped out and immediately had the urge to curse as someone nearly collided with me, continuing on their way as if nothing had happened. Exasperated, I sighed and turned my attention to the various neon signs adorning the dilapidated building before me. One in particular caught my eye. Vigilant law offices, eh? I muttered with a chuckle. Who knew such an edgy guy would have a sense of humor? Shaking my head, I entered the building. Stepping onto the office floor, I was pleasantly surprised to find the interior exceptionally neat. The unexpected presence of a secretary added another layer of professionalism. Well, as they say, you can't judge a book by its grime-covered, crack-house-looking cover. Shaking off these musings, I approached the secretary with a friendly smile. Is Mr. Valley present? I inquired. She nodded, reciprocating the smile. Mr. Valley is inside and isn't seeing anyone currently either. You picked a good time, 
she replied, and I couldn't help but appreciate her choice of words. It was almost an open invitation for a witty, inappropriate remark, but my momentary surge of maturity won out, surprising even myself. I suppose I needed to grow up sometime, hey? The secretary paused momentarily as her eyes fell on Radigan, and the look in her eyes made it extremely obvious that she found the cheeky rat cute adorable even. If only she knew what a pain in the ass he was. Seeing as she was taking her sweet time appreciating Radigan's looks, I cleared my throat, and my gesture was enough to bring her back to reality. I'll only need your name and contact information before I let you in to see him, the secretary said. I obliged providing the necessary information with a polite smile before heading into Mr. Valley's office. Stepping inside after a polite knock, I found myself in a neat, simplistically decorated office room. Behind the desk sat a blonde man, his hair slicked back, adorned in a grey business suit. A pair of medical glasses perched on his nose added a touch of professionalism to his appearance, making him look more businesslike than even his business suit. The man in question, Jean Paul Valley, also known as Azrael, glanced at me then at Radigan, and immediately made that face you would make when you sense that things are about to take an interesting turn. Boy, was he spot on. Chapter 16, Temporary Chill Welcome to my humble abode, Mr. Valley said, a friendly grin accompanying his rise from the chair. I mirrored the smile, closing the distance to his desk. Micah. Foster, I offered, reaching out for a handshake. Valley reciprocated, acknowledging with a nod. Jean Paul Valley, but you probably knew that already, he remarked, releasing my hand. People rarely set foot here without some prior knowledge of yours truly. A chuckle followed as he gestured to a nearby couch. Please, take a seat. I followed his lead and settled onto the couch, taking in the modest yet functional surroundings. Valley resumed his position behind the desk, leaning back casually. So, what brings you to my not so typical law office? He asked almost as if legal matters were an afterthought. Despite running a law office, he rarely ever worked as a lawyer. In fact, he used the office as a cover to run his private investigation gig, using his detective skills and computer expertise. He went out of his way to get a degree in law to make it a legitimate business and was more than capable than the majority of known A-listers in the field. However, everyone who knew him knew that wasn't the main attraction. Valley was a genius in more ways than one, and the term genius had a whole different meaning in Gotham's peculiar world. However, for me, it was the lawyer part that mattered today. Well, Mr. Valley, I began, adopting a conspiratorial tone, I find myself in need of some legal wizardry. Nothing too adventurous, I'm afraid. A sly grin accompanied my words. Valley cocked an eyebrow at my unusual request. Legal wizardry, hey. He pondered, a dash of confusion in his tone. Leaning back, he asked, so, what exactly do you need? Smirking, I fished my phone from my pocket. Take a gander, I urged, handing the device over. Valley took it, unlocked the screen, and hit play. Livewire's heroic escapades during the recent Metropolis invasion played out on the screen. Valley's confusion deepened, but he patiently watched until the end, shooting me a quizzical look. I'm here to recruit you as the devil's advocate, or in this case, Live wires. I casually stated. You see, I made her a promise lighter sentence, maybe even parole if she cooperates with the Justice League instead of tangling with Superman. Valley's expression shifted from confusion to mild irritation. Is this some kind of joke? He questioned, a touch of irritation in his voice. If it is, I must insist you stop wasting my I cut him off before he could finish. I assure you, no jokes here. Check out the next video, I urged. Valley sighed but complied, swiping on the phone screen to reveal the follow-up clip. It picked up seamlessly from the previous footage, transitioning to the front camera, capturing my grinning face as Livewire descended behind me, expressing her sentiments with a defiant middle finger. Valley sighed, returning the phone to my grasp. I see you're serious, but it might as well have been a joke, he calmly remarked. Representing such an infamous criminal sounds like a lost cause, and lawyers don't fight losing battles. He shook his head, elaborating on the potential consequences. What's more, there would be considerable backlash regardless of the outcome, and I prefer to keep a low profile. He concluded, a subtle suggestion in his eyes that it was time for me to take a hike. However, I merely shrugged. Superman himself is willing to bet on Livewire changing her ways. He promised to vouch for her to boot, 
so it isn't a lost cause. I pointed out. Knowing all that, is it really too much to ask to put some faith into Livewire? I added, narrowing my eyes. Valley, however, remained steadfast. I'm afraid it is, he said. Keeping a low profile is crucial for me due to various circumstances, and this case screams headline news. I'm sorry, but you'll have to find someone else, he stated firmly, rejecting the job outright this time. I sighed, feigning regret and putting on an expression of disappointment, channeling my acting skills. And here I thought you, of all people, would sympathize with someone looking for a second chance in life, I said, shooting Valley a knowing look. Valley's face instantly shifted to a darker shade at my words, and I could practically see the struggle in his eyes. It was like he was wrestling with the urge to jump over the desk and give me a solid punch in the face. What's that supposed to mean? He growled, making it clear that he might just follow through on that urge if my response didn't sit well with him. Jean Paul Valley's past as an assassin and puppet of St. Dumas's order was a sore spot, and I had just stepped all over it. Not to mention, the implied knowledge of his alter ego secret identities were a big deal in DC Comics, after all. Unconsciously, a smirk played on my lips. I figured you'd understand the struggle for redemption and a second chance, but maybe I misjudged, I said with a careless shrug, deepening Valley's scowl. Without missing a beat, I accessed the in-system shop and quickly snagged a specific item. Standing up, I casually strolled toward Valley's desk, showing no signs of fear. But if not out of kindness or sympathy, maybe you'd do it for this, I remarked, reaching into my jacket to pull out the recently purchased item and placing it on the desk. The glass bottle, a whimsical container of glowing nebula-like liquid, found its place on Valley's organized desk. A display of enchantment that was all flash and no substance, but for my current theatrics, it was the perfect prop. Valley visibly jolted by the sudden appearance of the potion, seemed to transition from surprise to a more composed curiosity. What is this? He queried, eyes darting between my face and the mysterious elixir. With a cheeky grin, I revealed my grand title. I call it the elixir of mental clarity, I announced, enjoying the dawning realization on Valley's face. In layman's terms, it's the one-stop shop for fixing that tangled mess you call a mind, I threw in, the grin broadening. Valley a bit bewildered, could only manage a hesitant, you, what? How would I even know if it will work? He asked, now sporting a deepening frown of skepticism as he gathered his bearings. Simple, my dear Valley, we test it out right here, right now, I responded casually, and the suspicion on his face instantly intensified at my words. Well, I'd be wary, too, if someone stranger suddenly pulled up a cosmic smoothie that would solve all my problems and told me to gulp it down. Snatching an empty glass from Valley's well-organized desk, I popped the cork off the potion bottle, letting a small amount of the vibrant liquid flow into the glass. Downing it with flair, I couldn't help but add, and just to clarify, I'm not attempting any underhanded poisoning antics. A dismissive shrug punctuated my assurance as I put down the potion. Valley eyed the peculiar potion skeptically as if it had just challenged his favorite chess move. His hesitation lingered, suspicion edged across his face. Yet, the tantalizing prospect of banishing the mental carnival that St. Dumas had bequeathed him proved too irresistible. After all, it wasn't just a muscle-building program, it turned his mind into a bona fide circus. Overcoming the brainwashing resulted in a state where Azrael and Jean Paul Valley were like roommates in a cramped apartment, with Azrael monopolizing all the assassin training and conditioning. Eventually, Valley managed to reconcile both personalities, but his mental state still resembled a traffic jam during rush hour. So he took the plunge. His hands trembled slightly as he raised the exquisite bottle to his lips. One gulp, two gulps, and soon the mesmerizing nebula of planets resided within him. The transformation unfolded like a time-lapse documentary initial confusion, followed by surprise, culminating in an unexpected tranquility. Valley turned towards me, wearing an expression akin to someone who had stumbled upon the secret to perpetual bliss. However, being the pragmatic soul that I am, I had to temper his elation. Hold off on the thank you speech, Mr. Valley. This potion is only a temporary solution. Especially considering I took a sip myself. I grinned, providing the reality check that his zen moment had a ticking clock. It's less eternal bliss and more temporary chill. Chapter 17, Warm Gotham Send Off Valley's accusation sliced through the air, his words dripping with betrayal. You, you bastard. He seated 
his face contorted as if he was confronting the devil himself. That was your plan all along, wasn't it? To give me a taste of freedom. To get me hooked and turn me into a pawn. The theatrical display could have earned him a standing ovation at a Shakespearean play. I blinked, observing this sudden surge of melodrama. Was this guy always so dramatic and quick to jump to conclusions? I'm seriously starting to question his genius. Seriously, do I look like a cheap crack dealer to you, pal? I retorted, annoyance etching my words, snapping Valley out of his self-staged tragedy. I sighed, a mix of impatience and bemusement crossing my face. The potion is just a temporary fix, Valley. But there's a permanent solution, I explained, mustering a fed-up expression. My gaze bore into him with a touch of judgment. I'm willing to share it with you on one condition represent Livewire and get her out of the big house. I raised an eyebrow, daring him to question my sincerity. At my words, Valley's face transformed from shock to a quick bout of shame. That's right, feel the embarrassment for unleashing such a cringeworthy spectacle. I was getting second-hand embarrassment just witnessing it. Ah. I see. He mumbled, throat clearing as he regained his composure. In that case, I will do everything within my power to get Livewire on parole as soon as possible, he declared, reverting to his earlier calm and professional demeanor as if erasing the awkward episode. The man had a thicker skin than a rhinoceros, that's for sure. Even Radigan was face-palming at his shamelessness. I nodded, dismissing the absurdity, and refocused on the matter at hand. In that case, I'll leave you to it, I nonchalantly stated, heading toward the exit. Your secretary has my contact info, so give me a call whenever you're ready to meet up with Livewire. With that, I swung the door open and stepped out, not bothering to wait for a response. Humming along with the radio and trying to grasp the lyrics of a song I'd just stumbled upon, I casually steered the rented car through the chaotic streets of Gotham. A happy soul, such as myself, in this gloomy city, was a rare sight, but I considered it all part of the unique charm that was Gotham. Ignoring the disgruntled drivers and scowling pedestrians, I continued my drive, my mind reflecting on the successful encounter with Azrael. To be honest, success was the only plausible outcome. Azrael would practically agree to anything I proposed in his quest to fix his tangled psyche. Now, one might wonder, if I was so confident that the magical potion would sway him, why bother with the guilt trip, exposing my knowledge of his alter ego? Well, my friend, that's where the brilliance of my plan comes into play, if I do so myself. There's this nifty thing known as the illusion of choice, a magical tool used by bastards, such as myself, throughout history to get what they want from unsuspecting souls. If I had merely handed him the potion and told him to jump over a chasm, he would have leaped without a doubt, but he'd harbor resentment, thinking I left him no choice but to take the plunge. However, if I provided him a reason to jump and topped it off with a tempting reward? Well, who wouldn't jump willingly, maybe even throwing in a little dance for good measure? Damn, sometimes I manage to impress even myself. Maybe there's a bit of genius in this brain of mine, after all? Grinning like a goof at my narcissistic musings, my self-congratulatory moment was abruptly shattered by Radigan's incessant chittering and finger-poking. What the hell do you want, rat? Must you ruin my good mood, you I began, but my sentence got cut off as the pesky rodent shoved his tiny hand into my mouth and forcibly turned my head. My immediate instinct screamed at me to hit the brakes and toss the little critter out of the window, but all such thoughts dissipated as I caught sight of a large, pointy object hurtling towards my car. A friggin' missile! I exclaimed slamming the handbrake and forcefully yanking the wheel to the right. The world began to spin around me as one metallic thud echoed in my ear after the other. And then. Boom. Blinking away the remnants of disorientation, I found myself dangling like a human bat from the car's overturned driver's seat. Radigan, my charming furry companion, continued his slapping protest, making sure I was fully aware of the crimson stream decorating my face. Fucking hell. I muttered my voice carrying a mix of annoyance and pain. With a groan, I attempted to recall the events leading to this upside-down escapade. Ah, right. Gotham and its usual welcome committee. How could I forget the friggin' rocket that almost hit me in the face? As my senses sharpened, the throbbing ache in nearly every inch of my body intensified. I couldn't help but appreciate the poetic timing of my misfortune just as Gotham transformed into its ominous nightly self. I fucking hate Gotham already, I wheezed falling back to my usual coping mechanism as I shifted my gaze to the inky sky outside the shattered car window. Determined to make the best of a bad situation, 
I started assessing the damages. The car is beyond repair and luckily insured. My pride? Well, that took a hit, but it had seen worse. My body? Damned if I knew, but if the pain was anything to go by. Radigan continued his chittering, probably criticizing my driving skills. Ignoring his rodent commentary, I began wriggling in an attempt to free myself from the seatbelt. Undoing the seatbelt turned out to be a straightforward affair, thankfully avoiding the cliched struggle. However, my victory was short-lived as I clumsily tumbled out head first, meeting the ground with a resounding thud. Note to self, practice graceful exits. Groaning, I managed to flip my body to the side, each movement accompanied by a symphony of pain. With a swift kick, I shattered the window on the passenger side and awkwardly wormed my way out, trying not to exacerbate the agony. A distant fire marked the spot where the rocket had mercilessly struck another unsuspecting vehicle, a grim reminder of Gotham's unforgiving nature. Suddenly, a shadowy figure descended from the darkened sky, landing with the kind of silent intensity that only Batman could pull off. Great, just what I needed Gotham's brooding protector. I eyed him as he stood over me, masked and caped, the epitome of stoicism. Are you all right? He inquired in that signature gravelly voice, extending a gloved hand. I accepted the help, muttering, I will be, once the lunatic who tried to blow me up is in the Gotham Asylum. Batman offered no commentary, silently aiding me in getting on my feet. Stay here, he ordered before preparing to leap into action. Yet, after one step, he abruptly lunged back, covering me with his cape. Gunshots echoed in the distance, and Batman shielded me until the threat subsided. As he withdrew the cape, a man brandishing a smoking Tommy gun stood before us, a twisted grin splitting his disfigured face. The man standing before me was a walking nightmare, and if I had to sum him up in one word, terrifying would be an understatement. Harvey Dent, a.k.a. Tufus, sported a suit that looked like a bizarre fusion of two different ones, sewn together down the middle. His smirk only enhanced the grotesque nature of his half-scarred visage. I see you're as eager to chase after me as always, Batman, he remarked, nonchalantly blowing smoke from his gun's barrel. But it won't be fun without just chasing me around, how about a choice? What's more important? The life of some hapless civilian or capturing me? With that, he pulled a grenade from his pocket and sent it hurtling in our direction before making a swift exit. Great, I muttered sarcastically, watching as Batman lunged at the grenade and threw it away while Harvey Dent ran away cackling like the maniac that he was. There I was, relishing in my own sense of triumph, only to be relegated to the role of a pawn the distraction for the villain's escape plan. The universe sure had a way of humbling me just when I thought I was on top. However, I refused to be humbled here, not by Tufus of all people. He might think I was just some hapless civilian, but that's where he made the worst mistake of his life. You know why? Because I'm not just some hapless civilian, in fact, I'm a hapless civilian with an interdimensional being cosplaying as a rat. Radigan, get his ass. Chapter 18, Radigan, the Rat Shogun. So, picture this I go, Radigan, time to shine. And bam. Out of thin air, the rat magician himself shows up. Now, in my head, I'm thinking he'll dash towards Tufus, and sink his teeth into that villainous rear classic hero move, right? But nope, Radigan takes it slow like he's strutting on a rat runway. Hands behind his back, head held high, giving off this vibe like the whole situation is beneath his rodent dignity. My eyes start doing a little twitch dance of annoyance. I was a second away from turning Radigan into a rat projectile and throwing him at Tufus. But the cheeky rat finally decided to make a move, raising his tiny paw and pointing it at Tufus like a seasoned general ordering a cavalry charge. Cue the rat parade. Suddenly, rats started popping up from every nook and cranny in the streets like they got VIP invitations. They came together, creating a tidal wave of vermin that engulfed Tufus faster than you can toss a coin. I'm just standing there, wide-eyed, taking in the spectacle. And get this, even Batman the brooding superhero himself looked a bit shaken. His gaze lingered on Radigan, like he was re-evaluating his entire bat life. Welcome to the weird side of Gotham, bats. Still, the broody caped crusader didn't seem all too amused by the spectacle. That's enough, Batman's gruff voice cut through the chaotic scene, breaking my momentary stupor. I mean, sure, the idea of letting the rats have a nibblefest on Tufus was tempting, but you just don't do the whole murder spectacle in Gotham, especially not with the caped crusader watching. It's like bringing a kazoo to a heavy metal concert just not the right vibe, 
not to mention a one-way ticket to the ER. Although I was going to the hospital anyway, I preferred my visit to be for strictly non-Batman-related reasons. You heard the man, Radigan. Pack it in, I muttered, clambering back onto my feet. Radigan shot me a look, the kind that screamed, seriously, mate. It's not like the rat had a diploma in criminology, but he sure had an attitude. Nevertheless, Radigan obliged, waving his tiny paws like some rodent orchestra conductor. The rat brigade dispersed, leaving Tufus on the asphalt, looking like he went a few rounds with a rat blender. Radigan, ever the showman, hopped onto my shoulder, acting like he'd just orchestrated the grandest performance in rat history. He then cast a haughty glance in Batman's direction. The whole situation was just weirdly surreal. I couldn't decide if Batman was impressed or pondering the absurdity of his job description. Evidently, he was just pissed. Batman took another glance at Radigan, his intense gaze shifting to me. You're the off-worlder who appeared in Metropolis, he stated, a tinge of suspicion in his voice. I responded with a nonchalant shrug. What are you doing in my city? He asked, clearly not thrilled with my unexpected presence. His tone, the classic Batman gruffness, echoed in the dimly lit alley. I raised an eyebrow at his inquiry. None of your business, I calmly retorted. While I had a soft spot for the caped crusader, I knew he wouldn't buy any flowery words or innocent acts I had to offer, so I didn't even bother. Even if my acting and persuasion skills promised to sway the most hard-headed people, I wouldn't try it on Batman. Even if I could trick him right now, he'd still find a reason to doubt me later, making him even more suspicious of me. You can roll over on your back and show Batman your stomach all you wanted, but he'd still trample over it if he thought you were a threat to this shithole of a city. Evidently, he wasn't thrilled with my answer. Then again, I doubted any answer would have made this broody guy break into a grin. You made it my business when you strolled into Gotham with this creature, he stated, his eyes narrowing as he observed Radigan. This city is already chaotic enough as it is. The last thing it needs is an unknown threat running rampant, he added, his disapproval palpable. I couldn't help but smile at his words. Well, lucky for Gotham, I don't have any more business here, I declared. Actually, I was on my way out when your pal over there thought it'd be hilarious to blow up my rented car with a friggin' rocket launcher. I gestured toward the unconscious Tufus, lying on the ground in all his post-rat apocalypse glory. That said, I do need to get patched up, so I'll have to linger here for an extra hour or two, I concluded with a sigh, eyeing my battered and scratched up body. Man, those were some nice clothes, too. Talk about a fashion tragedy. Though I was perfectly comfortable telling Batman to take a hike and mind his own business, pushing further would be like juggling lit dynamite. I wasn't interested in having him breathing down my neck. Frankly, I'd prefer a fire-breathing dragon on my tail than this guy. Evidently, Batman got the memo. Make it quick then. He grumbled, his tacit approval signaling that I wasn't on his immediate troublemaker radar. As I prepared to reply, a distant police siren echoed through the Gotham night, instantly diverting my attention. It didn't take long for me to realize my rookie mistake turning my back on the caped crusader. Classic blunder. One of DC's unwritten rules. Oh well. I'm definitely not turning around to check if he's still there. I muttered with a nonchalant shrug. Time to find someone to patch me up, I suppose. I stated, beginning to walk in the opposite direction of the incoming sirens. Radigan, perched on my shoulder, contributed to the banter with a series of chitters that unmistakably sounded like, as well as you should. You look like crap. I rolled my eyes at the cheeky rodent. Thanks for the insightful commentary, Captain Obvious. Lounging on my bed in my New York apartment, I couldn't help but crack a smile at the sight of Radigan, perched like a king on his makeshift throne of random items he'd gathered from around the place. The cheeky rodent was surprisingly cute when he wasn't being an incessant pain in my behind, but hey, even a cosmic being needs to unwind. I had contemplated heading to Leslie Thompson's clinic to patch up my battle scars. The woman knew her stuff, and I would have liked to meet her at least once, but the prospect of venturing into Gotham's East End, a criminal hotspot, was enough to make me reconsider. Plus, her clinic was perpetually bursting at the seams. So, opting for the peasant route, I settled for the regular hospital. Dodging the chaos of Gotham, ensuring no rockets were aimed in my direction, I returned to New York and promptly made my way to the car rental agency. With a heavy heart and a sizable dent in my pride I informed them of the unfortunate demise of their beloved vehicle. Insurance covered the damages, thankfully, 
but not before the clerk gave me a stern lecture about the sheer recklessness of stepping into Gotham. After wrestling with paperwork and enduring the clerk's scolding, I was finally set free. The day had slipped away unnoticed, and here I was, back in the apartment, nursing my wounds and contemplating the unpredictable nature of Gotham. Let's be real here, the entire incident was a consequence of my own questionable decisions. I waltzed into Gotham, well aware of its reputation, armed with nothing but my overconfidence. It's a miracle I didn't end up as a permanent resident in the city's graveyard all thanks to Radigan's last-second missile alert. Surprise, surprise I can actually admit when I mess up. Call it a rare moment of self-awareness amid my usual cocktail of arrogance and narcissism. But hey, wallowing in self-blame and regret wasn't my style. I preferred solutions over brooding, and luckily, I had the means to ensure this kind of mess wouldn't catch me off guard again. Inhaling deeply, I summoned the system's interface and made a beeline for the shop. Available points, 690, I muttered to myself, eyeing the digital display with a mix of satisfaction and contemplation. It was time to invest wisely in my survival kit for the next round in this chaos-infested playground of a world. Chapter 19, Upgrades Now, you might be scratching your head, wondering where on earth I accumulated all those points. Well, the answer is as simple as it gets the emotional roller coaster that was Jean Paul Valley during our little tete a tete. The guy was a genuine emotional masterpiece, and the points started rolling in as he navigated the tumultuous sea of feelings our encounter stirred within him. Now, Valley, he wasn't just your run of the mill guy. Batman once mentioned something along the lines of if Azrael could keep his emotions in check, he might outshine me in the fighting and detective department. Okay, those weren't the Dark Knight's exact words, but you catch the drift. Valley's emotional gymnastics were like a goldmine for my points collection. They were that potent. Batman himself, on the other hand, contributed zilch. Though I made a joke about him re-evaluating his bat life choices, he was, in fact, unfazed neither impressed nor bothered by me or Radigan. It was a peculiar mix of amusing and slightly offensive to me. I was offended because apparently, the caped crusader didn't see me as a significant enough threat to warrant extra caution like, come on a little paranoia wouldn't hurt. On the flip side, it was oddly reassuring not to have Batman's brooding presence breathing down my neck. All right, let's dive back into the world of upgrades and my grand plans. I had initially dreamt of saving up my hard-earned points to purchase a permanent mental shield you know, to fend off those nosy telepaths trying to sneak into my head. It seemed like a solid plan until Gotham happened. A near-death experience later, and I was seriously reconsidering my life choices. If I got into another similar altercation, there wouldn't be much of my brain left for a telepath to probe anyway. My knee-jerk reaction was to go all out and snag a flashy offensive power. Lightning shooting from my fingertips or lasers beaming out of my eyes classic superhero stuff. But reality kicked in, and I dismissed the idea faster than a bad movie. Sure, those powers were on the menu, but they came with a hefty price tag. Plus, they wouldn't do much to shield me from surprise attacks, like, say, an unexpected missile to the face. So, I shifted gears and contemplated a healing factor. I mean, who wouldn't want to channel their inner Wolverine? The dream was grand, but the budget, not so much. The cost of a regenerative power that could patch me up after a missile collision was astronomically high. Wallet, meet reality check I wouldn't be affording that luxury anytime soon. But enough about my failed superhero daydreams. I needed something practical, something that would keep me in one piece during unforeseen calamities. After some contemplation and much browsing on fiddling, I finally found something that would do the job. Guardian Veil, this nifty passive shield doesn't bother activating for everyday inconveniences like rain or a slight breeze. No, it's got better things to do. When danger rears its ugly head, the Guardian Veil materializes faster than you can say superhero landing. Whether it's a stray missile, a sniper bullet, or an overzealous pigeon, this shield's got you covered. Stray missiles, eh? I muttered, letting out a sigh of annoyance. The system, true to form, wasted no time in poking fun at my recent misadventure. Nevertheless, the Guardian Veil seemed tailor-made for my needs. Now, all that was left to do was check the price. Hey, just 500 points. I expressed my genuine surprise at the cost. While it was still a bit hefty for my current point balance, it felt like a steal considering the potential usefulness of this power. I pondered for a moment, wondering why it was so affordable, but quickly shook away the stray thoughts. Not one to question a good deal, 
I swiftly purchased the Guardian Veil before the system had a chance to change its mind. The result? Well, I didn't feel any different. Hmm. I hummed thoughtfully, scanning the room, my eyes eventually landing on Radigan, who seemed on the verge of falling asleep. The impulse to test out my new power alongside the intrusive thoughts got the better of me, and I found myself standing up, approaching the cheeky rodent with a grin on my face. With a flick of my ring finger, I tapped him on the nose. Radigan recoiled, shooting me a glare, and in the blink of an eye, he lunged at my finger with his mouth wide open. I winced and turned away, fully expecting Radigan's tiny teeth to sink into my flesh. But to my surprise, no pain followed. When I looked back, the cheeky rodent had his mouth around the tip of my finger, teeth halted just a hair's breadth away as if an invisible force shielded me. Well, color me impressed. Haha. <laughs> I'm finally rat-proof. No longer shall I fear I began, only to pause abruptly as Radigan, undeterred, opened his mouth wide for another bite. This time, however, there was a distinct sound of glass shattering as his teeth sank into my finger, introducing me to a symphony of pain that echoed through my nervous system. Ouch. All right, all right. I'm sorry. I yelped, desperately trying to pry Radigan off my now sensitive finger. After what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds, he relented. Jumping away, he landed on the bed, casting me a haughty look before sauntering back to his improvised throne. Meanwhile, I was left nursing my finger and contemplating the quirks of my newfound, apparently imperfect, rat-proof status. Oh, the cosmic irony of it all. Radigan's teeth, the tiny troublemakers that they were, managed to break through a barrier touted to stop missiles. Who knew our little rodent buddy had such celestial chompers beneath that unassuming exterior? It's either that or that the system's exaggerating, and I've been punked by a digital scam, which was unlikely since the system delivered everything its item descriptions promised so far. Flopping onto my bed, I pulled up the system again and eyed the measly 190 points left. Feels like I'm back to square one, reminiscing about the golden days of the tutorial quest. Not that it was eons ago it's barely been a blip on the timeline. Anyway, I shrugged off the nostalgia and ventured into the daily deals tab, and surprise, surprise, there was something that seemed useful, unlike that elixir or rambunctious laughter, or whatever it was called. Dreadbane Pendant, the ultimate fashion accessory for those who want to turn heads and make a lasting impression. Wearing this stylish amulet won't just make you the talk of the town, it will have townsfolk talking about relocating. With its cutting edge, edgy design and a touch of otherworldly magic, this pendant ensures that your attempts at intimidation will be met with gasps, widened eyes, and maybe a few involuntary shivers for the recipients making them see you as their worst nightmares. After a moment's contemplation, I decided to pull the trigger on the Dreadbane pendant. In the blink of an eye, there it was, a palm-sized circular slab with a small, cracked skull hanging from it, suspended by a black string. The skull itself was unsettling, its empty eye sockets seemingly shrouded in an ominous black fog that sent a shiver down my spine. Despite being a bit tight on points at the moment and needing to save up for some offensive firepower, I couldn't resist the allure of this pendant. It matched my skill set perfectly, aligning with the need to talk my way in and out of sticky situations. Given the circumstances of my transmigration and the peculiar nature of the system, it made sense to invest more in the art of persuasion for the time being. Reflecting on it, focusing on my conversational prowess seemed like a prudent choice. After all, I was still a novice when it came to combat. Even if I splurged on flashy and powerful abilities, I doubted my ability to wield them effectively at this point. Sometimes, it's better to work with what you know, which is using my big mouth on my enemies. God, that sounds so wrong. Forget I said that at once. Stop taking screenshots. Anyway, with my shopping spree concluded, I had nothing more to do, and it was time to hit the hay. After all, I have yet another busy day ahead of me tomorrow. Chapter 20, Dreadbane Unleashed As I checked the time on my wristwatch and observed the sky darkening, a mischievous grin spread across my face. I confidently strolled toward the darkest, most foreboding alley that New York had bestowed upon its inhabitants. Now, you might be scratching your head, wondering what occupied my day and why I was willingly delving into a mysterious alley. Well, I'll spill the beans I spent the entire day, from sunrise to this moment, sprawled on my bed, engaged in some serious phone fiddling. And no, I wasn't busy conquering virtual worlds or mindlessly scrolling through endless INSTagram reels. In reality, I was deep into research mode. 
I was on the hunt for easily influenced DC characters lurking nearby, a mission that seemed more enticing than the elusive pursuit of discovering hot, single moms in my vicinity at least in my current state. And let me clarify, there wasn't a magical database of such characters, I was simply googling heroes and villains based on their real names to pinpoint their locations. This intel would come in handy for a later visit, where I could casually swing by and snatch up some sweet points by trolling the shit out of them at my earliest convenience. I was a businessman at here, you see. But let's not get too sidetracked back to the wretched butthole of Satan, also known as the alleyway before me. Now, I'd gladly delve into the mundane details of what made this alleyway stand out or spill the beans on my grand plan for venturing into it. I enjoyed talking about myself and masterfully laid plans. However, reality check there was no master plan, and this was just your run-of-the-mill, stinky, probably thug-infested alley with no hidden treasures, caped crusaders, or dastardly villains. The reason for my visit? You'll catch on in a jiffy. Sauntering into the alley, I spotted a cluster of men loitering near a trash can, huddled together and exuding an aura of suspicious activities. A mischievous grin played on my lips as I approached them. Simply for the sake of my own amusement, I decided to break into an improvised song. Mugger, oh mugger, lurking near, I can sense you, have no fear. I hummed, even throwing in a skip or two for good measure. I'm just strolling, don't you see? This song is definitely not a trap, believe you me. I continued my lyrical masterpiece as I neared the group of men, with Radigan shooting me a disdainful look that clearly conveyed his lack of appreciation for my singing skills. Truth be told, I wasn't a fan either, but you've got to add a touch of dramatic flair to these situations. In the timeless tradition of street thugs everywhere, Thug A shot me a look that could sour milk. He swaggered over, asserting his territorial dominance like a wolf eyeing a clueless rabbit that stumbled into his makeshift den. Got lost, buddy. Thug A quipped, one hand discreetly playing hide and seek behind his back a classic mobster power move. I adopted a pensive expression, nodding sagely at him. Aren't we all lost? wandering in the labyrinth of life, searching for a purpose that would guide us to the light at the end of the tunnel. I remarked, watching as his eyes struggled to process the unexpected philosophical interlude. I mean, who drops Sartre in the face of an impending mugging? What, what? Thug A stammered, his bewilderment spreading like a contagious yawn among his posse. The purpose of life is a life of purpose, my friends. So, tell me what's your purpose? I asked dishing out wisdom like a sidewalk sage, locking eyes with Thug A as if I held the keys to the universe. Thug A scratched his head with the barrel of his concealed weapon, exchanging puzzled glances with his goons. Well, at this moment, my purpose is to have you run your pockets, snatch every shiny thing you've got, and maybe toss in a beating for good measure, he confessed with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer. I bobbed my head in agreement as if I'd just deciphered the universe's most cryptic riddle. Aha, not the grandest of purposes nor the most honorable intent, but a purpose and an intent nonetheless, I remarked casually, a nonchalant shrug punctuating my profound revelation. Very well, you may proceed. I clasped, raising my hands up in surrender and offering Thug A a stage for his nefarious performance, much to Radigan's apparent bemusement as he palmed his face. Thug A's expression twisted into further confusion, but he wasn't about to let existential musings derail his mugging ambitions. All right then, thanks. He mumbled, cautiously advancing with his weapon pointed in my general direction. As he closed the gap, hesitation edged across his face, he made a grab for my wristwatch. Quick as a cat with caffeine, I slapped his grubby hand away. Undeterred, he attempted another snatch, only to encounter another swift slap. Growing visibly frustrated, he shot me a baleful look. The hell do you think you're doing? You wanna die or something, dumbass? He snarled a cocktail of rage and confusion bubbling within him. I let out a theatrical sigh in response to Thug A's question. I told you to proceed with mugging, but I never said I'd cooperate, I deadpanned, my expression an epitome of indifference. Thug A squinted at me, a sudden realization dawning upon him. You. He began, narrowing his eyes as if he'd just realized something, his voice tinged with anger. Are trying to make a fool out of me. The question erupted from him like a volcano of indignation. I regarded Thug A with the fascination one might reserve for a rare, exotic animal. Do birds have hollowed bones? Do airplanes have horns? Do woodchuckers chuck wood? I quizzically fired back, my tone both whimsical and perplexing. Thug A's rage dissipated like a fleeting storm, 
replaced by genuine confusion. I... I don't know, he stammered, his bewilderment reaching new heights. His confusion was so clear and visible that I even felt bad for a fraction of a second, and then I remembered he was a dastardly, dark alley spawned lowlife trying to mug me. So I see, maybe instead of mugging me, your purpose should be to head to the nearest library, I suggested, shaking my head in mock disappointment. But yes, I am trying to make a fool out of you and, by the stupid look on your face, very much succeeding, I concluded with a mischievous grin, prompting a few chuckles from Thug A's friends and reigniting his smoldering rage. You bastard. I fucking knew it. Thug A erupted, his face transforming into a vibrant shade of red fueled by a mixture of anger and shame. I'll punch your teeth in. He proclaimed theatrically, brandishing the magazine part of his pistol as an improvised weapon aimed at my mouth. The gun struck its intended target, but it halted a hair's breadth away from my lips, thwarted by the protective shield of the Guardian Veil. Noticing my lack of reaction, Thug A's eyes darted between my composed demeanor and the suspended gun in his hand, registering the unexpected obstacle. Honestly, this level of stupidity would have been almost endearing if it weren't for the fact that it was being orchestrated by a grown-ass man in a dark alleyway. Stay in school, kids. Realizing I had lingered long enough in this theater of the absurd, I seized the opportunity presented by Thug A's distraction. With calculated precision, I delivered a devastating kick between his legs. Thug A crumbled to the ground, his face cycling rapidly through shades of red, purple and white as he collapsed in agony. Realizing Thug A had bitten off more than he could chew, his buddies hastily brandished an assortment of weapons guns, knives and what looked like a suspiciously hefty wrench and charged menacingly toward me. Maintaining my cool, I summoned the coldest, scariest look my acting and persuasion skills could muster. Piss off, I deadpanned, delivering the words with a simplicity that belied the potential danger. It was like I'd just uttered some ancient incantation, as the thugs hit the brakes with the grace of cartoon characters halting mid-air, collectively turning tail. They sprinted toward the alley's exit their hasty retreat akin to fleeing from a phantom menace. Perplexed, I turned around, half expecting to find a terrifying figure looming behind me Looney Tunes style, but the reality was disappointingly mundane. Hey, neat trick, I chuckled, watching the thugs vanish into the distance. Looks like the pendant is working as promised, I mumbled, appreciating the effectiveness of my newfound accessory. However, my contemplation was abruptly interrupted by a notification that materialized in my field of vision. Your relationship with, has shifted from, neutral, to, curious. Chapter 21, The Gym My head snapped to the rooftops like a cat spotting a laser dot. There, a shadowy figure stood, nonchalantly turning away as if they'd just finished watching the latest blockbuster. Seriously, who does rooftop voyeurism in New York? My first instinct was to engage in superhero mode, activate my Stormwalker shoes, and ascend to the heights to give Mr. Shadow a piece of my mind. But then reason kicked in what if my shoes failed me mid-air? Splat not a glamorous way to go. Considering the potential disaster of chasing mysterious figures, I shrugged off the superhero urge. Sure, I thought about sicking Radigan on them, but my furry companion had a flair for turning simple tasks into chaotic odysseys. Can't have him starting a rat rodeo where I couldn't even stop him. Oh, well, what's the worst that could happen? I muttered, letting the thought drift away like New York fog. Time to swing by and give that boxing gym another look, I decided, strolling toward the alley's exit. The mysterious rooftop dude could have his moment, I had my priorities namely, learning to throw a proper punch and maybe working on my stamina. Walking into the gym, I couldn't help but be impressed. The place buzzed with energy as people put in the sweat and effort for their training. A pair of guys were locked in a boxing ring, throwing punches like it was a contest of who could defy the laws of physics more. Meanwhile, a young woman unleashed a flurry of blows on a punching bag, making its way and regret all its life choices. In the midst of this vigorous symphony of physical activity, a middle-aged, muscle-bound man caught sight of me checking out the scene. He flashed a welcoming smile, his weathered hands suggesting he'd danced with many a punching bag in his day. With a confident stride, he approached, ready to welcome a potential new recruit. Welcome to the gym, kiddo. Are you here to sign up? The man asked a twinkle of enthusiasm in his eyes. I took a moment to appreciate the man's seasoned physique short, tank top, calloused knuckles, and cauliflower ears. He practically screamed boxing veteran. Even someone as clueless about boxing as me could tell this guy had seen his fair share of ring action. I gave him a nod. I'm considering it, 
I replied. The man's grin widened. Then let me give you the introductory tour. He said, motioning for me to follow as he led the way into the world of jabs, hooks and sweat. The man guided me through the gym's impressive array of facilities. From the bustling boxing rings to the clanging weights and lifting equipment, and even a pool, sauna and a specialist for muscle injuries it was a champion's training ground not that I had a clue what that should look like, but this place seemed top notch. As we circled back to our starting point, the man beamed at me with pride. Well, what do you think? He asked, eager for my verdict. I chuckled, rubbing the back of my head. Well, it does look impressive, but I honestly wouldn't know, I admitted, earning a thoughtful nod from the man. An amateur, then, he declared, and I had to concede that he hit the nail on the head. Tell me, what is it you want? What kind of training do you need? He inquired. I thought about learning to throw a proper punch, maybe build a bit of stamina, I explained. But now that I've taken a closer look at your gym, it might be out of my price range for now, I added with a sigh. The Justice League had thrown some funds my way, but this gym looked like it could chew through cash faster than I could say knockout. Plus, I planned on being frugal with the league's money returning every penny once I found my footing in this world and even ditching the apartment they provided. It was part caution so the league wouldn't always have tabs on me and part pure stubborn pride you see, I lived and grew up just fine, relying on no one but myself in my past world, and I planned to do the same here. The man chuckled, as if he found my worry amusing. With a shake of his head, he reassured me, you don't have to worry about that just yet. His explanation followed, describing the gym owner as a bit of a weirdo but more interested in cultivating talent than making a profit. World champ, hey. I muttered the words echoing with a strange familiarity tied to the sign above the gym's entrance. Shoving aside the distracting thoughts, I refocused on the man. Sounds intriguing, but what's the catch? He pointed toward the now deserted boxing ring nearby. You just gotta hop into the ring and show me what you've got, he grinned widely. Impress me, and I'll happily recommend you to the boss have him cut you a sweet deal. Taking a moment to mull it over, I nonchalantly shrugged. Fair enough. Just so we're clear though I'm no Rocky Balboa. My boxing knowledge is probably limited to the jab and dodge from video games. The man waved off my concerns with a dismissive gesture. Boxing isn't just about technique, it's about spirit, kiddo. Anyone can learn how to throw a punch, but you can't teach heart, he explained, leading the way toward the ring. So, are you up for the challenge? Grinning like a Cheshire cat, I soaked in the cliched but enthusiastic atmosphere. The guy in front of me was clearly passionate about his gig, and even I had to appreciate anyone enjoying what they do as much as he did. Well, if you insist on wasting your time, then who am I to stop you? I teased as I gracefully ascended into the boxing ring, earning a nod of satisfaction from my overly enthusiastic coach. That's the spirit, kiddo, he applauded with a grin. There's a pair of gloves in that corner, suit up and tell me when you're ready. Nodding, I retrieved the gloves ready to turn off Guardian Veil and put on a show. But as I started to gear up, a sudden realization hit me like a surprise uppercut. How in the world do you turn off Guardian Veil? I fumbled with the gloves, trying to maintain composure while secretly panicking. No wonder the damned thing was so cheap. As it turns out, my super useful, cost-effective ability had a little snag it didn't have a friggin' off switch. Observing the coach eagerly smacking his gloves together, a bead of sweat formed on my forehead. Hold on a second. I just remembered there's a very pressing matter I need to attend to, I confessed with a sheepish grin, desperately searching for an escape route. The coach, with an air of no nonsense, shook his head. Sorry, kiddo. Stepping into the ring and stepping out of it are two entirely different ball games, he stated firmly. Attempting to negotiate my way out, I began, I mean, I get the whole serious vibe here, but my sentence hung in the air as if awaiting the punchline of a cosmic joke. Suddenly, the coach closed the gap between us with superhero speed, fist cocked and ready to deliver a punch that would likely take my head off if the Guardian Veil's barrier wasn't protecting me. Panic set in, but my quick thinking kicked, though my brain almost malfunctioned. As his fist zeroed in on my face, I executed a nimble lean back and shift weight maneuver, gearing up to take the fall the moment his punch collided with my invisible shield, intent on putting my acting skill to full use. The irony of having to stage a tumble before I could even start my illustrious career as a boxer wasn't lost on me. I'm sure I would have had a wise-ass remark about it in any other circumstances but now wasn't the time. Maintaining my composure, 
I stood my ground, biding my time until the coach's fist seemed a mere two inches from my face. Bracing for my impeccable performance, I was ready to collapse in a dramatic tumble when, to my bewilderment, the coach's punch halted before connecting with the invisible barrier. Swinging my gaze toward the coach, my eyes widened at the knowing smirk on his face. He took a purposeful step forward, lowering his center of gravity as he readied another punch, even as I began my descent. Did this guy have some insider information or something? Chapter 22, Wildcat Number 22 Before I could react, the second punch landed, abruptly halted by the Guardian Veil's barrier. As I sprawled on my back, annoyance bubbled within me as I shot a glance at the coach. Well, taking a punch to the barrier on my way down wouldn't be as noticeable. I pondered, contemplating how to salvage the situation maybe I could make it seem like I instinctively threw myself back to avoid getting hit. Though it stings my pride a bit. As I prepared to voice my ingenious cover-up plan, the coach's next words caught me off guard. You don't know how to turn it off, do you? He quipped, wearing a sly grin. Let me tell you, if my acting skills hadn't been top-notch, my eyes would have been as wide as saucers. Suppressing my shock, I put on a facade of confusion. Turn what off? I feigned innocence, blinking with exaggerated slowness. However, the coach saw through my act, shaking his head. You could have fooled me, kiddo. Even professional sellers couldn't perform such a perfect dive, he remarked, revealing his keen observation. But I saw you earlier in the alleyway, so I won't be so easily convinced, he assured with a knowing smile. As I processed his words, two notifications appeared in my vision. Your relationship with, has shifted from, curious, to, impressed. You have been rewarded 150 points. What rotten luck. I couldn't help but curse inwardly. Out of all people, why did it have to be the same guy who saw me in the alley, turned out to be a coach in the gym I wanted to enroll in, and, on top of that, a DC character? No, this can't be a coincidence. I need to figure out more about this guy. He was a boxer, but that's all I knew so far. And I suppose it was all a strange coincidence. I asked, narrowing my eyes suspiciously. A coincidence? Hell no, kiddo. You think this is a comic book or something? The coach replied with a chuckle. The truth of the matter is that a friend of mine asked me to keep an eye on you. He added extending his hand toward me. I glanced at his hand, then back at him. So, you're telling me you've been spying on me on behalf of a friend? What kind of shady business is this? I quipped, reluctantly taking his hand and getting up. The coach laughed heartily. Easy there, tiger. No need for conspiracy theories. My buddy just wanted to make sure you weren't some troublemaker up to no good. So, a friend wanted him to keep an eye on me, a guy who'd only been in this world for a couple of days? Now who on earth would be so paranoid? Stupid question, who else but Batman? The Dark Knight, and Gotham's own paranoia guru. So, this guy is a boxer, who is also somehow connected to Batman. I mulled over, racking my brain trying to think of characters that fit this peculiar profile. Only one name pops up, but if it's him, he should be running this gym, not just coaching. I deduced. Time to play detective, or, you know, just wing it. I shot a bemused look at the coach. And I suppose this is the part where you tell me you're secretly the gym owner and have been pulling my leg. I quipped, tossing my metaphorical hat into the ring. To my surprise, the coach flashed a grin. More or less. Guilty as charged, he admitted, offering his hand for another round of shaking. Name's Ted Grant, he added. I inwardly sighed. Classic wildcat move. I thought, mustering up a wry smile. Ted Grant, a.k.a. Wildcat, Justice Society member and the man who threw punches before and took the no-nonsense, fist-first approach to heroics before Batman made it cool. Unlike Batman, Ted Grant decided to take on the unofficial role of training up incoming heroes rather than obsessing over the so-called mission. He even taught Batman at some point. I shook Ted's hand, deciding it was time to ditch the theatrical act and get real. I guess skulking in the shadows and staging a surprise brawl in the boxing ring is one unique way to vet someone, I quipped, arching an eyebrow as I shot Ted a look. But you do realize that by laying it all out for me, you've pretty much made your job that much more difficult. I pointed out. Ted just chuckled, his laughter ringing through the gym. Hiding in the shadows is more that guy's M.O. than mine, he explained, waving a dismissive hand. 
Plus, my buddy already knew my playbook, he added, shooting me a meaningful grin. I furrowed my brow in confusion. Ted's rationale made sense, but why in the world would Batman ask Wildcat to keep tabs on me? He definitely wasn't dumb enough to assume Wildcat would stick to the shadows and watch me from afar like a creep. Struggling to come up with an answer, I turned to Ted, seeking some clarification. So, what's the hell does this buddy of yours want anyway? I questioned. Ted threw a nonchalant shrug my way. Who can decipher the inner workings of that guy's mind? He remarked. One thing's for sure, though he might seem gruff and antisocial, but he's not all that bad once you get past the broody exterior, so I'm sure you don't need to worry. To be perfectly honest, I wasn't thrilled about getting on Batman's radar. Ted's words, though accurate, didn't exactly brighten my day. Broody, paranoid, and a bit of an asshole that's Batman for you. Yet, considering the situation, he wouldn't go out of his way to make my life more complicated unless I gave him a reason to, which, as far as I knew, I hadn't. I could dwell on it but now wasn't the moment. Well, this has been an enlightening experience, I said with a sigh, shaking my head. But I do have to get going. I turned toward the side of the ring, intending to make my exit. Just as I was about to slip through the ropes, Ted's voice halted me in my tracks. Wait up, kiddo, he called out. I paused, turning to him with a questioning look. You still want to sign up for training, don't you? He asked a hint of anticipation in his eyes. I took a brief moment to ponder before nodding. Despite my reservations about Batman meddling in my business, the training was a necessity. Plus, Wildcat had trained his fair share of heroes, and through him, I could gain access to some people I wouldn't meet otherwise. After all, I still needed to troll the hell out of people and farm them for points. Priorities, you know? Good, then strap in for the ride, Ted declared with a grin, bounding off the ring like he owned the place. He gestured grandly for me to follow his lead. Just so you're mentally prepared, I won't be throwing any softballs. It's gonna be hell, and then some, he warned, a mischievous chuckle escaping his lips. I just shot him a nonchalant smile and shrugged, channeling my inner zen. Sounds peachy, I quipped, as if signing up for a torture session was just another item on my daily agenda. In my past life, I'd practically been a corporate gladiator, navigating the endless maze of office routine for ten hours a day like it was nothing. So, a bit of physical exertion? Child's play. Livewire slouched on the uncomfortable prison bunk, her metallic-clad fingers drumming an impatient rhythm against the cold, unforgiving surface. The crackling energy that usually danced around her had been replaced by the dull, sterile hum of the prison's dampening field. It was enough to make any electric villain ponder the irony of life choices. Where is that know-it-all shit stain when you need him? She muttered to herself, shooting an accusatory glare at the blank walls. Impatient as she was, Livewire had expected a get-out-of-jail-free card by now, a promise Micah had made in exchange for her shocking talents during that Metropolis fiasco, despite it happening only a few days ago. As she waited, her frustration grew, and her monologue to the silent walls transformed into a colorful symphony of curses, each word more inventive than the last. If that bastard double-crosses me, I'll turn his face into a disco light show. The distant clank of footsteps echoed through the corridor, prompting Livewire to jump to her feet. About time. She called out, assuming it was finally time for her to regain her freedom. To her dismay, it wasn't Micah but a stern-faced guard heading toward her cell. Leslie Willis, you have a visitor. Chapter 23, The Right Man for the Job Number 23 I wiped the sweat from my forehead, and it felt like I'd just dunked my head in a kiddie pool. Ted was relentless today. I dodged another one of his punches, and I swear I felt the whoosh of air as it passed by, whispering, you lucky son of a bitch. Keep those hands up, kiddo. Ted barked, a grin on his face that said he was enjoying this more than I was. And trust me, that's what's happening here exactly. Sure, I had this invisible barrier that would block the punches and stop me from getting hurt, but that doesn't extend to exerted muscles, you know? The exhaustion was one thing, but pulling the occasional muscle while trying to keep up with friggin' Vilcat, of all people, was my primary source of anguish. Hands up, dodge left, not right. Are you trying to get a free nose job from the wall? Ted's coaching came with a touch of sarcasm. Sure, Ted, let me just ask the wall for their finest rhinoplasty. I tried to maintain my composure, but Ted was making it as easy as herding cats. You know, 
I think I preferred getting mugged in the alley. Less cardio. Ted chuckled, and I swear the gym lights flickered. Was that him, or just the gym's questionable wiring? Who knows? As I stumbled out of the ring, Ted clapped me on the back, a bit too hard, maybe. You survived another day, kiddo. Maybe one day, you'll even throw a punch that doesn't scream, I hope you're injured. That's the dream. I grumbled, wiping away the sweat that had declared my face its new home. Maybe I'll even achieve it once you get around to teaching me how, you know, instead of just throwing punches my way and telling me to dodge. I shot Ted a bemused look, hoping for a hint of sympathy in that demonic boxing coach excuse of a face. Ted, the eternal optimist, grinned broadly. What good would that do, kiddo? He said, his tone carrying the wisdom of a thousand boxing matches. I just stared at him, a mixture of resignation and exasperation painted across my face. Build up some stamina, then strength, and maybe, just maybe, we'll delve into the secrets of the mighty jab, he said, waving away my aspirations like they were pesky mosquitoes. As much as it hurt my pride to admit it, my years chained to the corporate desk had left me, well, not in peak superhero shape. I wasn't overweight or anything, but I wasn't rocking a six-pack either. In other words, I was your garden variety, unremarkable guy not too skinny, not too fat, and with the stamina of a snail on a lazy Sunday afternoon. Ted had his work cut out for him, and so did I. Yeah, yeah, I get it, I muttered, swiping the gym towel across my face. Ted's definition of a workout seemed to be more about enhancing my endurance than refining my technique. You're a work in progress, kiddo, Ted chimed in, reading the frustration on my face. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither is a knockout punch. His sage advice was accompanied by a pat on my shoulder, which felt more like a hammer swing. Thanks for the wisdom and the fractured shoulder bone, Captain Obvious. With a half smile, I gathered whatever was left of my dignity and trudged towards the lockers to get changed. Radigan, who was watching me get my ass handed to me from the sidelines made a series of amused chitters before scurrying over and climbing into my back. Well, as long as your royal highness was amused by the spectacle, then I suppose enduring the ordeal was worth it. I quipped, casting a sidelong glance at the little rodent. Radigan, my ever-arrogant furry companion, nodded as if my suffering had finally gained his approval. Uninterested in a verbal skirmish with the pesky pest, I simply rolled my eyes and sauntered over to my locker to check on my phone. Lo and behold, a missed call notification from an unknown number graced my screen. Given that I'd only shared my number with one person, it could only be Azrael, Gotham City's most underwhelming genius. Taking a brief moment to ponder, I decided to return the call and see what was on his mind. Azrael picked up promptly. Hello, Mr. Valley. I greeted him my words hanging momentarily as he briskly reciprocated the salutation, launching into an extensive monologue about his current location and activities. Oh? You're visiting Livewire, I see. I responded with a nod. So, what's your initial impression? I inquired, strategically tuning out Livewire's colorful language as she threatened to unleash a lightning storm on me for making her wait so long. Azrael continued his enthusiastic chatter, explaining how he had delved into the extensive list of crimes Livewire had faced. Apparently, he'd also taken the liberty of gauging the ever-fickle public opinion, particularly after her dramatic actions during the Metropolis attack. His optimism radiated through the phone as he detailed the meticulous inspection of the situation. I must say, we're in a much more favorable position than anticipated, Azrael declared confidently, his tone resonating with newfound optimism. The public's perception is malleable, especially after recent events. If Superman holds up his end of the bargain and vouches for Livewire, as promised, securing her parole is practically a done deal. I listened attentively, the wheels in my mind turning as I processed Azrael's assessment. Livewire's predicament seemed to have taken a turn for the better, at least from Azrael's calculated perspective. Sounds like a plan. And trust me, Superman's word is as solid as his chin, I assured Azrael with a nod. Now, Pass the phone over to Livewire, would ye? Azrael complied, and soon Livewire's snarky voice buzzed through the phone. What does the two knowing brick want now? She grumbled. I couldn't help but snicker at that one. Just a few pearls of wisdom for ye, Sparky, I replied. Mr. Valley's gonna give you a golden ticket out of the slammer, so try not to turn it into a disaster before you even step out. Capis. Livewire, true to her electrifying nature scoffed on the other end. Back off, pal. 
I don't need a babysitter, she retorted. This is my gig, remember. I raised an eyebrow, laying down the law. This is as much my gig as it is yours. I'm the one making happen, remember. I said with an exasperated sigh. I'm placing a lot of trust in you, and so is Superman. So, I need you not to turn the city into a friggin' light show the moment you walk out of jail easy enough, right? I tossed out the reminder like a warning shot. I could practically sense Livewire's irritation even before she uttered a word. Yeah, yeah, I've got it drilled into my skull. We're on the same page that I'd need your help once I'm out, she grumbled, letting her sentence hang for a dramatic pause. And I'm not spelling out the consequences if you decide to pull a fast one on me, the threat lingered in her words, as clear as a neon sign. I just scoffed. We've indeed covered that ground. Something about me getting a zappy makeover if I drop the ball, I retorted. You can rest easy, if you keep your end of the bargain, I'll uphold mine. So. How about you dial down the voltage and behave yourself in the meantime? I tagged on, throwing in a light chuckle to take the edge off. After a barrage of thinly veiled threats and an abundance of Livewire's signature sass, I finally managed to shoo her off the line. The real struggle, however, began as Azrael delved into the riveting world of parole appeal procedures. It was like listening to a lecture on paint drying. He painstakingly elaborated on the bureaucratic hoops we needed to jump through, the anticipated duration of the entire process, and his master plan to cozy up to a sympathetic judge. Apparently, said judge's daughter had been coincidentally saved by Livewire during the Metropolis attack. Azrael, with his wrecked emotional state and genius-level intellect, was an odd mix, but damn, he knew his way around the legal labyrinth. Trusting him with Livewire's case seemed like the most logical move. As he droned on, I couldn't help but marvel at how he smoothly maneuvered through the intricacies of the law seamlessly integrating his expertise in private investigations and computer wizardry. There was no denying he was the right man for the job. Yet, a lingering concern persisted Livewire's penchant for chaos. I really hoped she wouldn't topple the painstaking scaffolding Azrael was building once she tasted freedom. It would be a colossal shame, especially considering I had plans of my own for her. Chapter 24, Shows Down Number 24 Dragging myself to the corner after another round of Ted's merciless training, I plopped down, sweat pouring like I'd just taken a dive in a waterfall. It had been a few days since I signed up for the Wildcat Boot Camp, and let me tell you, dodging punches was becoming my jam. Stamina was on the up, and I'd upgraded from pulling a muscle every five minutes to maybe once an hour. Progress, right? Glancing at Ted, the guy looked like he hadn't even heard of the concept of sweat. The man was well into his sixties, but he was pulling off the fresh out of the shower look. Must be that mythical nine lives thing or a secret pact with the sweat gods. Whatever it was, I needed in on that. Besides the whole boxing gig, I'd been keeping my detective hat on. Yesterday, I cracked the case wide open. Now, it was all about the crazy planning stage. I even had this mental board going on, you know, the kind they show in movies when they introduce a character fixated on something, except my fixation was on finding people and trolling them for points. Brain on overdrive strategy brewing the works. And now, it was time to enact the first phase of my plan, shamelessly asking Ted for help. Sporting the most charming smile in my acting arsenal, I turned to face my relentless taskmaster, Ted. Hey, Ted. What do you say to doing a little favor for your dear student? I threw out, my expression oozing sweetness. Ted raised an eyebrow, clearly amused. Well, that depends on the flavor of favor my dear student has in mind he replied, his tone as sly as his grin. I leaned in, playing up the charm. Oh, nothing too big for an awesome guy such as yourself. Just need you to introduce me to Ted Cord you know, the big cheese over at Cord Industries, I said, adding a touch of exaggerated admiration to my expression. Ted's skepticism was palpable. And why would I know Ted Cord, let alone be able to introduce you? He questioned, shooting me a look that suggested he wasn't buying it. I chuckled shooting him a sidelong glance. Come on, Ted. You strike me as the guy who knows everyone you're practically buddies with the broody one from Gotham, right? I teased. Ted sighed, scratching his head as if I'd just cracked a complicated code. So, you caught on to that, hey? Not like I was being subtle, but sure, he mumbled. I don't personally know Ted Cord, but I do know someone who does, he added after a brief pause. I perked up. 
perfect. If you could just I began, but Ted cut me off with crossed arms and a stern look. Hold your horses, kiddo. First, spill the beans. Why do you want to meet Cord? Ted demanded. Rubbing my hands together, I threw Ted my most charismatic grin. I've got a business proposal for Cord, something that could benefit both of us, I declared, a spark of excitement in my eyes. And who knows, if it takes off, I might even be able to afford your gym subscription. Wouldn't that be a dream? I teased, hoping to tap into Ted's sense of humor. Ted, however, was unfazed. Kiddo, I couldn't care less about the money. As I said, the owner of this gym is a weirdo who isn't interested in profit, he shrugged, pointing at himself. His nonchalant attitude made it clear that financial gains were low on his list of concerns. But I'm guessing your interest in court isn't just about scrounging up the money for Jim. He probed, narrowing his eyes knowingly. You're looking to untangle yourself from the league's apron strings, am I right? He added, a wide grin playing on his lips, revealing a depth of understanding. Caught off guard, I couldn't help but admit, well, yeah, that's part of it. The thought of perpetually relying on the League's goodwill didn't sit well with me, but there was more to my ambitions. The way I see it, this world is full of opportunities. I explained, leaning against the gym equipment. I'm not content being just another face in the crowd. To carve out a piece of success, I need more than just a big mouth and a charming smile I need the green, and Ted Cord's got plenty of it, I concluded, emphasizing the necessity of financial freedom in my pursuit of self-discovery. Ted scrutinized me with an intense stare, as if sizing up the legitimacy of my aspirations. After a thoughtful pause, he returned to his trademark grin. If that's how you feel, who am I to stand in your way? He declared with a nod of approval. Give me a SEC, I'll make a call and see what strings I can pull, he added as he pivoted on his heel, heading toward his office. I nodded in acknowledgement. Thanks, Ted, I called after him, genuinely grateful for his willingness to help. In his usual nonchalant manner, Ted merely waved without bothering to turn around or acknowledge my gratitude. Sitting at a table outside a cafe, sipping on a cup of coffee, I couldn't help but sigh, thoroughly bored with nothing to do. I eyed Radigan, perched on the table, nibbling on a piece of cheese. The idea of messing with him to break the monotony briefly crossed my mind, but the memory of his teeth sinking into my flesh was enough to quash that impulse. Instead, I sighed, resigned to my uninspiring fate. To my delight, Ted had returned after his brief absence, bearing news that his contact was on board with introducing me to Ted Cord. The catch? I had to twiddle my thumbs for two days because the person to introduce me to Cord was busy. When I pressed Ted for more details about this mysterious contact, he deftly sidestepped my inquiries. With nothing better on the horizon, I decided to wander the streets of New York and ended up parked at a cafe table, nursing a cup of coffee. When in doubt, caffeinate yourself into oblivion right? As I sat there, contemplating the mysteries of the universe, or at least my impending meeting with Ted Cord, Radigan enjoyed his cheese, seemingly oblivious to my existential musings. Now, for the interesting part. Just as I was weighing the pros and cons of antagonizing my rodent companion for amusement, a distant roar shattered the humdrum atmosphere. Explosions and screams followed suit, abruptly pulling me out of my coffee-induced stupor. I swiveled my head towards the source of the commotion and, Lo and behold, witnessed a green leopard perched atop a nearby building. This wasn't your ordinary feline moment, though. It was surrounded by peculiar-looking drones armed to the teeth. Not your typical afternoon in the Big Apple. The drones, showing a distinct lack of hospitality, peppered the green leopard with bullets. But the leopard dodged and weaved through the onslaught before leaping at the closest drone. And here comes the kicker midair, the leopard morphed into a gorilla, delivering a series of smacks that would put King Kong to shame. But the show wasn't over. The gorilla turned into a hummingbird, gracefully evading further drone attacks, and then wait for it a whale. The colossal sea creature crashed into the remaining drones and the ground, leaving chaos and wreckage in its wake. Just as it seemed the shapeshifter was about to emerge victorious, a pint-sized man suddenly showed up. When I say pint-sized, I'm not exaggerating. The guy was so short he could probably use a ruler as a walking stick. Hovering in the air with what looked like jet boots every short person's dream, I suppose he sported a grin as wide as his stature was small. In the midst of the drone-ridden chaos, as the shape-shifting animal held its ground against the metallic onslaught, a pint-sized hero emerged. I mean really pint-sized. 
the guy was so short he could probably use a ruler as a walking stick. Hovering in the air with what looked like jet boots every short person's dream, I suppose he sported a grin as wide as his stature was small. With a swagger befitting a much taller individual, he brandished a peculiar, sci-fi-ish gun. I've got you right where I want you. He declared triumphantly, aiming the mysterious weapon at the colossal green whale. Whatever the gun unleashed, I couldn't quite see, but the effect was immediate. The massive whale morphed back into its original form Beast Boy, a card-carrying member of the Teen Titans. Now even your teen wonder friends can't save you, you dumb animal. The vertically challenged antagonist gloated, reveling in Beast Boy's obvious agony. It was like watching a short-statured maestro conducting a symphony of chaos. Grinning at the unfolding spectacle, I realized fate had thrown me a bone another chance to crush boredom and, hopefully, harvest some well-deserved points. Feel like stretching your legs, buddy. I asked Radigan, who responded with an annoyed chitter as if he wasn't too thrilled with the idea of doing anything that was remotely productive. Despite his reluctance, his gaze suggested he was at least willing to entertain whatever nonsense I was about to spew. Well, here's what I need you to do. I began, outlining my master plan to involve a rodent in my quest for entertainment. Chapter 25, Nemesis Number 25 My eyes couldn't help but light up with amusement as I approached the miniature tormentor, basking in Beast Boy's momentary agony. Clearing my throat dramatically, I aimed my address at the vertically challenged mastermind. Hey, how's it going, short stuff? I called out causing him to pivot towards me with a look that could rival the glare of a thousand suns. Simultaneously, my interface buzzed with notifications. Your relationship with, Gizmo, has shifted from, neutral, to hostile. You have been awarded 200 points. Well, well, it seems someone is guarding their stature like it's a national treasure. I knew Gizomo was a bit sensitive about his height, but I didn't expect such a big reaction. Not that I was complaining, mind you. What's with that look, pal? I'm just here to ask you a question. I stated, the casual shrug of my shoulders implying that Gizmo's piercing gaze was about as consequential as a gnat in a hurricane. How's the weather up there? No one's ever asked you that question before, right? I tacked on, my grin widening with the satisfaction of needling him. Beast Boy, still writhing under the effects of Gizmo's gadget, gritted his teeth and mustered the strength to growl, Hey, man, get out of here. This isn't your fight. I glanced at Beast Boy with a smirk, offering him a wink and a casual, Nat, I'm good right here. Turning my attention back to the irate gizmo, who was seething like a teapot on the verge of boiling over, I resumed my delightful banter. So, gizmo, I've always wondered, do you use a kiddie pool as your bathtub, or is even that too steep for you? The little guy was visibly fuming, which only fueled my amusement. Without warning, gizmo unleashed one of his tech marvels a laser gun, aiming it straight at me. Little did he know, my guardian veil's invisible barrier was at the ready, effortlessly blocking the attack. Gizmo's eyes widened in disbelief as the strange energy projectile fizzled and disappeared upon hitting me. I chuckled, unabashedly reveling in the absurdity of the situation. You might need a booster seat for that aim, buddy. The glare Gizmo shot my way could have melted steel, but I was having too much fun to let it bother me. Gizmo stood there staring at me in sheer disbelief, his initial shock slowly transforming into contemplation. The wheels in his genius mind were turning as he muttered to himself, energy barrier, hey? Interesting. I couldn't help but be impressed. Behind the comically small stature and the apparent love for chaos, Gizmo was indeed a prodigy. Sure, it was somewhat obvious I had some kind of invisible, considering that not a hair on my head had been singed and that even my clothes were unscathed, but his quick deduction was still impressive. A mischievous grin danced across Gizmo's face as laughter erupted from him. Not bad, but here's the kicker, could your fancy barrier handle a building collapsing over your head? He quipped, toying with a gadget on his wrist. I shot back with a nonchalant shrug, not knowing the extent of the barrier's durability myself. Gizmo's laughter only intensified. Even if it can. You'll be buried and suffocated under the rubble. He declared, a fleet of drones arriving and aiming their guns at a nearby building. Instead of clicking the button, he just looked at my face as if waiting for me to acknowledge his genius and beg for my life. Genius he might be, but his vanity and need to gloat was almost as conspicuous as his intellect. If only he'd performed his plan without broadcasting it, there might not be much I could do to stop him, but he did, and here we are. Sounds peachy, 
but you might want to check out what's happening behind you. I suggested, pointing beyond the pint-sized genius. His immediate scoff. What kind of idiot do you think he said, pausing halfway through his sentence as he noticed the large shadow on the ground below him. Gizmo eyed the looming shadows with a mix of confusion and dread. He turned to me, his Adam's apple bobbing nervously. I kept up the theatrics, dramatically pointing behind him as if unveiling the grand finale of a magic trick. With an unmistakable sense of reluctance, Gizmo pivoted around, only to face an incoming tsunami of New York's biggest, filthiest rats. It was a sight to behold a rodent ballet choreographed by Radigan, ready to engulf Gizmo in their not-so-affectionate embrace. What the Gizmo managed to utter before the tidal wave of rats descended upon him like a furry avalanche, bringing him to the ground. He wrestled with the wriggling mass of rodents, attempting to fend off their collective rodential assault. Witnessing him grapple with the furry onslaught, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Amidst the chaos, I reached into my jacket pocket, strolling toward the pint-sized genius, and halted as a substantial shockwave pulsed from his body yet another one of his gadgets, no doubt. The force rippled through the rat army, sending them flying in all directions and setting Gizmo free from their verminous clutches. Gizmo's teeth clenched audibly as he shot me a venomous look. You. He spat out, his eyes narrowing with menace. I'll make you pay for this someday. His words oozed a half-hearted threat, clearly signaling his intention to make a hasty retreat. But sorry, no swift exits are allowed on my watch. Without missing a beat, I reached into my pocket and procured a peculiar item a Robo Cockroach, my latest impulsive purchase from the system. Because where else does one instantly find a cybernetic bug? Right? I flung it in Gizmo's direction, almost on autopilot. Gizmo, in a momentary lapse of judgment, instinctively snatched it from the air. As he examined the mechanical critter in his palm, his face turned whiter than a ghost, and he froze in place. Out of all Gizmo's flaws and weaknesses, his irrational fear of bugs, or entomophobia, if you want to be fancy, was likely the most crippling of the lot, even more than his megalomania and need to broadcast his plans before executing them. Knowing that golden nugget of info, I would have been an idiot not to use it, and so I did. Casually approaching the pint-sized villain, I gave him a knock on the head, and Gizmo promptly crumbled to the ground, unconscious. Your relationship with, Gizmo, has shifted from, hostile, to, nemesis. You have been awarded 450 points. Perusing through these notifications, an amused eyebrow arched upward. It seems I left a more lasting mark than I initially intended, but hey, who cares? Points secured, and Gizmo was nothing more than the resident comic relief for the Teen Titans not worth losing any sleep over. Unfortunately, I didn't have much time to overthink the aftermath of my encounter with Gizmo or his status as my now sworn enemy as the sound of approaching footsteps snapped me back to reality. Swiveling around, I laid eyes on Beast Boy, now in his human form, sporting a grin wide enough to light up Times Square. Dude, that was wild. I've seen some crazy stuff but taking down a villain with a wave of rats? That's a whole new level. Beast Boy exclaimed, radiating the excitement of a kid on a sugar rush. His energy was infectious. You're not the usual hero type, hey? What's your deal, and how'd you do that? His curiosity bubbled over, an eager grin plastered on his face. I'm no hero, bud, I replied with a nonchalant shrug. And that rodent orchestra wasn't my doing, it was all this guy. I gestured toward Radigan who had scampered over my body and now perched on my shoulder like a furry sovereign surveying its kingdom. Beast Boy's eyes practically lit up with excitement, like a kid in a candy store. No way, that's so cool! He exclaimed, eagerly reaching out to pet Radigan. However, his enthusiasm was met with a swift nip, prompting him to recoil with a yelp. Whoa, feisty little guy, hey! He chuckled nervously, holding his finger. Sorry about that. Radigan isn't as friendly as he looks, I added with a smirk, fully aware of the rodent's unpredictable nature. Anyway, don't you have somewhere else to be? I raised an eyebrow at Beast Boy, who seemed to snap out of his fascination at my words. Instantly, panic flashed across his face. Oh, right. I gotta help the others. With a swift transformation into an eagle, he took to the skies. I'll catch you later, dude. His voice echoed before fading into the bustling city sounds. Thanks for listening.